Yes, a very good morning to all of you. Right, so how was your FRSFM paper? <clears throat> right, I hope my voice is uh, clear and I'm audible to all of you. Okay, right, so all good with the FRSFM paper. So now all set, you know, you're in the momentum of writing the exams over there. Right, so let's have a good revision of the subject. Please put into the chat box regarding, you know, Joby topics, whichever topics you want me to cover or any particular chapter or any particular question or any particular standard on auditing. Right, so whatever best possible, we will try to cover it in the class. Okay, right. So now to begin with, like, you know, audit, like, is it or we are in theory and practical and what is it? What practically is happening regarding audit all around? Okay, so if we look into the this particular latest order of the NAFRA. Now, the reason why I'm showing you the order is by reason of the order, we will study a few of the provisions over there. Okay, right. So, this is like the latest one passed on 28th of April. That is the Rashtriya Vitiya Reporting Pradhikaran. That is the National Financial Reporting Authority, right? The NFRA under Section 132.4, right? And this is the order which has been passed against the Chartered Accountant, right? The order which has been passed against the Chartered Accountant, right? So, it says Executive Summary, Introduction, and Background, the major lapses in the audit, other lapses in the audit, then the findings on articles of charges of professional misconduct by auditor and the penalty and the sanctions okay right so it says the executive summary of the findings right so there was a company engaged an auditor yes failure the engagement partner what does it say the ep the engagement partner failure to plan the audit and understand the entity and its environment failure to determine the materiality and the performance materiality failure to obtain the audit evidence regarding the existence and condition of inventory failure to identify the related party and the related party transactions is anything coming to your mind when you read this when you are seeing this over here failing to plan the audit sa 300 failing to understand the entity and its environment sa 315 failure to determine the materiality and performance materiality sa 320 failure to obtain regarding regard evidence regarding the existence and condition of inventory 501 failure to identify related party transactions sa 5 50 right then failure to obtain external confirmations for trade receivables and trade payables that is sa505 failure to report the non-compliance with the laws and regulations that is sa250 failure to identify and communicate with tcwg that is sa260 yes were you able to identify these with me if you are able to identify, that means you are knowing about these particular uh, auditing standards over there. Such failures were in violation of the law and the standards on auditing and led to professional misconduct. And then it says the statutory auditor of the company, the NFRA, took the action against the auditor. Right. And what does it say? The engagement partner was told to submit the audit file and SQC1 policy of the firm, which sub was submitted. But however, now look at this. The engagement partner was charged with professional misconduct of charged with professional misconduct of does anybody yes not the anybody all of you it has to come to you failure to exercise due diligence and is being grossly negligent in the conduct of professional duties where is this coming in clause yes clause yes sfm is most difficult in history oh my god okay right so you want me to take automated environment okay right so yeah we will look into amendments you can go to the amendment video and check it out over there right so tell me this one failure to exercise due diligence and being grossly negligent in the conduct of the professional duties clause 7 of the part 1 of the second schedule right clause 7 of the part 1 of the second schedule what does it say does not exercise due diligence or is grossly negligent in the conduct of the professional duties okay right then after that failure to obtain sufficient information which is necessary for expression of opinion or its exceptions are sufficiently material to negate the expression of an opinion so that is clause Eight of the part one of the second schedule fails to obtain generally a periodical magazine question it comes over here it fails to obtain the sufficient information, fails to invite attention to any material departure from the generally accepted audit procedure. So that is the clause 9 of the part 1 of the second schedule, fails to invite attention to any material departure from the generally accepted audit procedures applicable to these circumstances. Right. So engagement partner guilty of professional misconduct under 712 
812 and also guilty of professional misconduct under the 912 right also guilty of misconduct under the 912 okay right then the engagement partner was required to reply then we have considered the written and oral submissions of the engagement partner now the major lapses in the audit failure to obtain evidence regarding the existence and condition of inventory right so which auditing standard are they talking about sa501 the audit evidence specific consideration for selected items as an auditor what are the audit procedures you need to perform to obtain evidence regarding the existence and condition of inventory right as an auditor you need to attend the physical verification count being conducted by the management at the year end date unless impracticable right so attend the e physical verification count at the year end date so 31st march you go for the stock count right and now when you are attending the physical verification of inventory what you need to do you need to evaluate management's instructions you need to observe the count procedures you need to inspect the inventory you need to reperform the test count and you also need to reconcile with the actual inventory records right so what is that you need to attend the physical verification count one of the favorite question of icai right existence and condition of inventory as an auditor you need to attend the physical verification count being conducted by the management at the year end date okay not possible for you to attend on the year end date then what do you do you attend it on an alternative date right you attend it on an alternative date or the date on which the physical verification has been conducted by the management right see not and then on that day again you perform these procedures which you would have performed on 31st of march and additionally you check for the intervening transactions that is say if you are doing the count on 2nd of april so whatever transactions have taken place between 1st april to 2nd april right so additionally check for the intervening transaction see so alternative date also physical verification not possible then what you do as an auditor you perform the alternative audit procedures you can check the uh, documentation regarding the movement of inventory purchase sale of inventory so you perform the alternative audit procedures to obtain the sufficient appropriate audit evidence but see even after performing the alternative audit procedures you are unable to obtain yes everyone are you all with me you are unable to obtain the sufficient appropriate audit evidence that means it's a limitation on scope and what do you do in case of a limitation on scope either you issue a qualified opinion or you issue a disclaimer of the opinion right so qualified opinion or the disclaimer of the opinion right anyways what are we discussing over here the nafra order passed on 28th of april against one chartered accountant so what does it say the engagement partner was charged with failure to obtain evidence regarding the existence and condition of inventory so what audit procedures we are discussing over here these audit procedures were not performed by the auditor right these audit procedures were not performed by the auditors right so what does it say physical verification at reasonable intervals and the evidence and so right then the reply of the engagement partner as and are not accepted as no documentation was found in the audit file the importance of inventory verification cannot be overemphasized then next one failure to identify the related party and the related party transaction so what are we talking about over here sa 550 whose responsibility to as such to identify related parties it is the responsibility of the management you as an auditor are going to indirectly check right so what are the audit procedures so now i am discussing with you sa 550 the audit procedures to identify the related parties yes i want the chat box flooded with answers okay tell me what are the audit procedures to identify the related parties that means which are the records and documents which can give information to the auditor regarding the existence of related parties which records and documents can give information to the auditor regarding the existence of related parties yes quickly tell me audit procedures again a favorite question from sa 550 which records and documents can give information hey to this looks like a related party over there yes you obtain the confirmations from the bank lawyers third parties okay then also you look into the 
minutes of the meeting yes then you also look into the income tax return because income tax 40 a to b is you know payments to specified persons right so there are specific provisions regarding payments to related parties right yes then after that you also look into the life insurance policies because from that you come to know the key managerial personnel then you see the invoices agreements which have been entered yes from the legal advisors of the company the invoices from the legal advisors of the company so they have taken an advice before entering into a transaction then any contracts or arrangements which have been renegotiated during the year or which have been entered into with the tcwg or which have been renegotiated during the year so again you wonder why did they renegotiate fir pata chala ki are related party ke sath hai and then you came to know kids with the related party then you look into the internal auditors report he can even that can give you information regarding related party ke internal controls were not followed when related party transactions were getting recorded right then after that also what does it say the papers filed with the regulator like the prospectus and so right then the shareholders register so these are records and documents the statutory records of the company these are records and documents which will help the auditor to identify the existence of the related parties and here what does it say no no this auditor failed to identify the related party and the transactions entered into with them it was noted from the investigation Right, so failure to identify related party. What am I showing you over here? Those of you who joined little late or something, right? I am showing you the NAFRA order which has been passed on twenty eighth of the April, right? So what does it say? Showed gross negligence and did not show professional skepticism as was expected from his him as an auditor, right? So doing an audit is was never a joke and is no longer you know further a joke over there. Then failure to obtain external confirmations for trade receivable and trade payable. That is SA five zero five. The external confirmation. process right so external confirmation process what it is sa505 first you need to select the items for the confirmations then for the selected items you need to design the confirmation request then once you design the confirmation request you need to communicate it to the appropriate third party then you need to obtain the response and if you don't get the response then you send the alternative what do you say you uh, send the second reminder or perform alternative procedures and then you evaluate the information or the lack thereof right so what is this this is the ec this is the external confirmation process what is the external confirmation process one selecting the items for confirmation then designing the confirmation request you remember the factors to be considered while designing the confirmation request the form of the confirmation request the factors affecting the reliability the intended respondent then the prior experience on similar engagement then the nature of information and the assertion being addressed Right, so these are the factors to be considered while designing the confirmation request. Then communicating the confirmation request, then obtaining the response, and evaluating the information or lack thereof. Okay, so. selected a few parties few few debtors to whom you want to send the confirmation request and management saying auditor no 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 sending confirmation request to debtor a and debtor b so what do you say okay no problem we will not send Yes, do you remember the heading which I am talking about over here? Yes, all of India, pura Bharat, मुझे सुन रहा है कि आप सब लोग मेरे साथ हैं. आप सब लोगों के ऊपर एक बहुत बड़ी जिम्मेदारी है. There is a big responsibility on all of you. All of you have to get an exemption for me. I'll be so happy. I'll so be so happy if you do that. Okay, so you have to work really hard for me. Okay, so let me try to put in my hard work over there. Okay, so 500 series are important for exam, huh? Because a lot of practical questions, now case studies come from that series. Okay, right. So, anyways, what is the heading that I'm talking about? Management's refusal to allow the auditor to send a confirmation request. Okay, 10 minutes. Tell about the presentation of the paper. I will do that. Okay, I will tell about that. Right. So, management's refusal to allow the auditor to send a confirmation request they are telling auditor debtor a debtor b no sending confirmation request auditor says i will first send to them auditor you can't be hyper like this so what you will do as an auditor you will ask the reasons to the management ke management why why not to send a confirmation request to debtor a and debtor b and why not to send a confirmation request then whatever reasons they give you need to check for the validity and the reasonableness of the reasons given by the management the validity and the reasonableness right then what you do oh they are telling no to the auditor how dare they 
right so the impact of the management's refusal on the auditor's assessment of rmm including the risk of fraud and the nature timing and extent of the other audit procedure so auditor has taken like a rudra avatar over there he says you said that i cannot send confirmation request to these debtors how dare you so you know auditor says that means in your debtor i think there is a fraud that means now i need to change the nature timing and extent of my other audit procedures also then you say might be some genuine reason why they may not be allowing me to send the confirmation request so then what you do keep a block of ice on your head and then you say perform alternative audit procedures you know to obtain sufficient appropriate audit evidence but even after performing alternative audit procedures uh huh mm -hmm, unable to obtain unable to obtain what sufficient appropriate audit evidence what to do qualified opinion or disclaimer of opinion or auditor you may also decide to withdraw from the engagement whatever you decide to do you need to communicate it to tcwg right you need to communicate it to tcwg is it clear to all of you anyways where is anafra order oh my god so this chartered accountant failed you to obtain confirmation for trade receivable trade payable okay right then the company's management had denied the contact details of the parties due to the fear of losing the business information and they did not want to share such business sensitive information okay so full uh, a point over there that other lapses in the audit failure to plan the audit and failure to understand the entity and its environment what do we say auditor should establish the audit strategy auditor should develop the audit plan and any changes made to the audit strategy audit plan and your failure to document Right. So, what does it say? Understanding of the legal regulatory framework at the macro level, and there has been no understanding obtained as such. Right. While planning the audit, you are required to obtain. Did not refer to any document evidencing the audit planning. Immediately after getting the appointment letter, we had a meeting with the top management, and so. Right. So, what does it say? The reply of the engagement partner are irrelevant to the charges. Right. So then, after so that is failure to plan and failure to understand the entity and its environment. Then failure to identify the TCWG and failure to communicate with TCWG. Oh my God, we have an auditing standard SA two sixty communication with those charged with governance. So in the entity, it is identified that these are TCWG. Then you directly communicate to them. If this entity doesn't know the term TCWG, first you have a discussion with the management as to whom you will consider to be TCWG. and then you need to communicate to tcwg yes all my intelligent students you are going to tell me what are the matters to be communicated to tcwg right what are the matters to be communicated to tcwg yes everyone quick fire in the chat box right i want quick big answers over there we also need to refer this document where it is this document you put on google nfra then if nfra website will open in that there is an icon called as orders and under that orders you will find so many orders over there okay right so what are the matters to be communicated to tcwg one the matters relate tcwg the highest level of management in an organization which one right what are the matters yes what matters relating to the auditor's independence okay how the auditor has maintained his independence during the audit whether there are any threats identified to his independence second one the significant findings from the audit right so whatever are the significant findings from the audit again you need to communicate it to tcwg then the responsibilities of the auditor in relation to the financial statement audit that even though if auditor is appointed to do the audit there are certain responsibilities on the management also it's not that you shift the entire burden on the auditor right so responsibilities of the auditor and also clarifying what are the responsibilities of the management and also the planned scope and timing of the audit giving the tcwg a overview of the planned scope and timing of the audit right under significant findings from the audit we communicate five points to tcwg under significant findings from the audit we communicate the five points to tcwg what points do we communicate significant qualitative aspects of the entity's accounting practices right so you find some accounting policies accounting estimates disclosures it could have been done in a more better manner that you can communicate to tcwg the significant qualitative aspects next one the significant difficulties encountered in performing the audit so all the big big problems and a big big stone problems and a rock problem 
problems which you identified during the audit so the significant difficulties encountered in performing the audit right then after the significant difficulties the significant matters unless tcwg is also involved in managing the entity right then circumstances affecting the form and content of the report right circumstances affecting the form and content of the report and any other matter which in the auditor's professional judgment should be brought to the attention of tcwg right significant difficulties encountered in performing the audit can you tell me what significant difficulty did you encounter in performing the audit you say ma'am there was unusual delay in providing the information there was un willingness of the management to provide the information there was unwillingness of the management to do the assessment of the going concern there was unavailability of the entity personnel there was unavailability of the information which was required for conducting the audit there was unexpected effort required in obtaining the audit evidence there was un reasonably brief time which was given for the completion of the audit so did you notice everything over here starts with the un and unusual what does it say unusual delays significant delays in management providing the information they imposing a limitation on the scope of the audit and imposing a limitation on the scope of the audit all these matters we will communicate to tcwg right all these matters we will communicate to tcwg and this particular auditor what did he do over here failure to identify tcwg and then on top of that failure to communicate with the tcwg okay then communicating also 265 deficiencies in internal control right has not commented on the charges okay so they have not commented then failure to report non compliance with the laws and regulations so that is sa 250 consideration of laws and regulations in an audit of financial statements so are you getting the flow i am showing you the nfra order and simultaneously we are also discussing and we are also discussing the standards over there right so sa 250 laws and regulation consideration of laws and regulations in an audit of financial statements so as a part of my audit i also need to check whether the entity has complied with the applicable laws and regulations for the purpose of sa 250 one what you need to do what are the audit procedures to be performed by the auditor bolo tell me everyone what are the audit procedures to be performed by the auditor step 1 understand make inquiries of the management ask management management how many laws are applicable to your company how you are complying with those laws have you maintained a register of significant law have you designed internal control have you given training to your employees to comply with the law so step 1 understand make inquiries of the management regarding the compliance with the laws and regulations then for those laws and regulations lnr is what laws and regulations which have a direct effect on the financial statements example income tax act and directly it affects the provision for tax and the advance tax right so direct effect for that you obtain the sufficient appropriate audit evidence whether these laws and regulations have been complied with then for other laws and regulations like you know labor laws environmental laws other laws and regulations which may have a material effect so it will not always have but which may have a material effect on the financial statements in case of non compliance for that what you do you need to perform the specified audit procedures yes you perform the specified audit procedures what are the specified audit procedures inquiry and the inspection right inquiry and the inspection of the correspondence with the environmental authorities labor authorities and so right so other laws and regulations for that you perform the specified audit procedures then auditor what you do you remain alert throughout the audit you maintain an attitude of professional skepticism and last one whose responsibility to comply with the laws and regulation it is the responsibility of the management so as an auditor what you need to do you need to obtain the written representations from the management right so one student is continuously asking kitne time tak chalega ye revision right so around 2 and a half hours is what i have planned for but let's see how it proceeds further okay right so anyways yes have you understood this the audit procedures 
right the audit procedures for sa 250 right laws and regulations right so inquiries of the management and laws and regulations which have a direct effect for that you obtain the sufficient appropriate audit evidence for other laws and regulations you perform the specified audit procedures then you remain alert throughout the audit and you also obtain the written representations from the management is it clear to all of you okay right then see you come across the non-compliance then what you need to do you need to check the effect of the non-compliance on the financial statements what could be the effect of non-compliance on the financial statements one it may lead to fines penalties damages litigation threat of parting away from an asset what it may lead to it may lead, affect the true and fair view third it may affect the going concern of the entity or it may require the disclosures or it may require the disclosures right so effect of non-compliance recently this question is trending okay what is the effect of non-compliance on the laws and regulations what is the effect? It could lead to fines. It may affect the true and fair view. It may affect the going concern. Okay, license cancel ho hai hai na? Go first. You can't go, go first now. And with that airlines, I am filing for bankruptcy, insolvency over there. Right? So it may affect the going concern. It may require the disclosure. Right? So effect of non-compliance on the laws and regulations. Is it clear to all of you? Right? So SA 250, consideration of laws and regulations in an audit of financial statements. So this auditor failure to report non-compliance with the laws and regulations. So that means did not perform the procedures of SA 250. Auditor shall document the identified or suspected non-compliance and discuss with TCWG and so. Right? And again, next one, failure to determine materiality and performance materiality do you know how to determine materiality don't tell me you don't know how to determine materiality malum hai na sabko hai na mere ko aisa lagta hai ki kuch bachcho ko aisa hai jinko hindi bhi aati hai to unko lagta hai ye ma'am hindi mein kyun nahi padhati hai aur par jin logo ko hindi nahi aati hai wo pareshan ho jate hai ki why is she speaking in hindi she should speak in english i prefer no english no hindi nothing i should just speak with you in audit language i think that's fair that's done, no? Okay. Right. So, anyways, what we are talking about over here is the determination of materiality. How do you determine the materiality? Right? How do you determine the materiality? For the determination of materiality, we have the concept of the benchmarking, right? So, what you do, you select a benchmark. What could be the examples of benchmark? You could take revenue of the company, gross profit of the company, PBT of the company, part of the company. Right? So, you take up a certain benchmark and to this chosen benchmark, you apply a percentage and whatever is the resulting amount, that is the materiality. And percentage into benchmark is equal to materiality. Right? So, percentage into benchmark is equal to materiality. And how? what are the factors that help in the identification of an appropriate benchmark? One, the volatility. The benchmark which you select should not be very volatile. Then the elements of the financial information. If you see it's a new company, they have no revenue so far. So, then you cannot take the revenue as a benchmark. Right? So, the elements of the financial information. Right? Then after that, the nature of the entity, that the needs of the users. Okay? in the nature of the entity and then the needs of the users right so the nature of the entity whether it's a what you say a manufacturing company or a software company accordingly you decide to take the benchmark users right okay what are the users interested in and the last one is the structure of the entity right so you look into the shareholding pattern the debt ridden whether it's a debt ridden company or so so factors to be considered in the identification of an appropriate benchmark Right, so here this is how you determine the materiality, and this auditor over here failed to determine materiality and the performance materiality, right, for the purpose of assessing the RMM and determining the nature, timing, and extent of the further audit procedures. Next one, failure to document the sampling methodology adopted for substantive testing. Oh my God! And whatever sampling methodology has been adopted, statistical, non-statistical sampling, or random selection, systematic selection, monetary unit sampling, haphazard selection block selection which name and a failure to document the sampling methodology right so again what does it say 60 to 70 percent of the transactions were covered and copies of the sales invoices were enclosed and so however they could not you know what failure to document the audit sampling methodology during the course of the audit then failure to appoint the eqcr and if you're doing audit of listed entities eqcr is compulsory others it is left at the discretion of the firm 
right so eqcr the work of one ca being reviewed by another ca before the report is issued an objective evaluation of the significant judgments made right so the eqcr is going to go through all the three matters in the audit the matters relating to independence the risks identified the responses the materiality the matters communicated to tcwg the appropriateness of the report right these are the matters which are going to be covered in the eqcr review and this audit no eqcr done when ep was charged with failure to determine the appointment of the eqcr okay right then finding on the articles of charges oh my god entire audit given to the uh, articles to do right what does it say given the actions the engagement partner what does it say has not ensured audit quality and was grossly negligent in the conduct of the professional duties right and again did not has contained the article of charges in the s show cause notice are established right so fail to exercise due diligence fails to obtain information and then this is the order which has been passed against the auditor impose a penalty of not less than 1 lakh which may extend to so much amount and then the penalty imposed is imposed a monetary penalty of 2 lakh rupees and is debarred for 2 years from being appointed as an auditor or internal auditor or from undertaking audit of any institution or so right financial activities of any body corporate or so right so these are the actions which are taken against the chartered accountant and then the copies have been marked to all of this Right, so whatever we are studying is, you know, highly what you say practical over here. You see the legal, like they are saying, the auditor has not followed SA five zero five. Auditor has not followed SA five fifty. Auditor has not followed SA two fifty laws and regulations and so. Okay, right. So similar one more order being passed over there against another chartered accountant. Again, it says same major lapses in the audit over here also. Right, so introduction and background again the. failure to obtain evidence right so again a similar order being passed over there right then recently this is a new one which has come on 3rd of uh, may right which is regarding the uh, what do you say failure to, uh, sorry removal of auditor by tribunal or cg you know this section 140 sub section 5 Right, you know, Section two one one, which is regarding the serious fraud investigation office. So they wanted to file a complaint against uh, the, what you say, say that the auditor has not done the audit properly, but he was no longer the auditor of the company. So he says, if he is no longer the auditor, you cannot take any action against him. The NCLT cannot take any action against him. But Supreme Court said, no, you can still take an action against your past auditor also. Yes, action can be taken against the past auditor also. So, what is that over there? Section one forty sub section five, practical application. It has been flashing on CNBC, uh, you know, TV News eighteen over there regarding the section one forty sub section five. I think my audit students would be remembering. अरे ये क्लास में पढ़ा है, है ना? Regarding the removal of auditor by tribunal or CG. Right? What does it say? The tribunal either suo moto. Right? The tribunal either so motto on its own or based on an application received from cg or any person concerned the tribunal is satisfied what is the tribunal satisfied that the auditor of the company he bhagwan has no don't write he bhagwan in the exam i'm just telling you that the auditor of the company has acted in a fraudulent manner or has abated or colluded assisted or participated in any fraud by or in relation to the company or its directors or officers the tribunal may by order direct the company to change its auditors the tribunal may by order direct the company to change its auditors what does it say the tribunal either suo moto or based on an application received from cg or any person concerned is satisfied what satisfied that the auditor of the company has acted in a fraudulent manner or has abated or colluded in any fraud by or in relation to the company or its directors or officers it may by order direct the company to change its auditors if the application is received from cg and the tribunal is satisfied then the order has to be passed within 15 days and the new auditor will be appointed by the central government right the auditor will be appointed by the central government okay and such an auditor against whom the final order has been passed by the tribunal cannot be appointed as an auditor of any company for a period of 5 years and shall be liable under section 447 and shall be liable under section 447 that is removed 
removal of auditor by tribunal or CJ. And can the matter also be referred to the SFIO, the Serious Fraud Investigation Office? Yes, it could also be referred to the Serious Fraud Investigation Office, right? So it says 140 and then also the matter from High Court, it went to the Supreme Court and now they say that SFIO can take the action against the auditor, right? So the factual background, it's a 103 page order over there. Okay, it's just to, you know, it's an opportunity for me to discuss the latest reality of the profession along with uh, what you say, discussing the subject. This, this one chartered accountant, I don't know what came to his mind, but he said there are accounting irregularities in the financials of ICAI. He said, I want a special audit of ICAI done. I think there are accounting irregularities. Now see, who does the audit of the financial statements of any entity? A chartered accountant. So ICI financial statements are also audited by a chartered accountant. He says, no, no, I want to get a special audit done. Right? They, you say, they say you appoint the CNAG and you, you refer the matter to the CNAG. CNAG says this does not come in our scope. And we do not look into that matter. So then it says, okay, a special audit will be conducted, right? Okay, so Union, the Institute of Chartered Accountants of India, right? So the Chartered Accountant filed a complaint with the NOK independent body like CNAG should do the audit of the ICAI for improving the transparency and the accountability in the operations of the second respondent, right? So the ICAI, right? Special audit of the financial statements being conducted by the CNAG. What was his insistence? This Chartered Accountant was saying, okay, let the financial statements of ICI be audited by CNAG, a special audit be conducted. But CNAG says this does not come in our scope. Right? CNAG says it does not come in our scope. So the petitioner says that he is a chartered accountant, lawyer, practicing chartered accountant. When the, the petitioner has been a member of the institute for more than 25 years, he is an active member of the profession, senior faculty professor in the area of accountancy and the grievance that there are certain financial irregularities being committed by the chartered accountant institute. And petitioner raised several objections regarding the financial irregularities committed. Okay, right? Something interesting you came to know? Yes? Is this something latest talk of the town? I know the buzz which is happening around. Okay. Anyways, these were a few documents which I wanted to discuss with you. But now let's get on to our discussion. Uh, I forget to mention about it later. So that's why I'm just mentioning it straight away. Uh, that on the Telegram channel, I have updated, I have uploaded uh, around 70, 80 mind maps or so many mind maps I have uploaded over there for the standards on auditing. In the latter part of the day, I'll uploading it for other topics also. So just for, you know, you can just zoom in and just have a quick revision of the auditing standards. If you have the time and if you have the requirement. Otherwise, no need unnecessarily to spend your time over there. That is one. Then apart from that, I'm also going to put a, upload a few MCQs over there. Right. So in case if time permits you and if it is good for you, then you may also, you know, just consider uh, just uh, what you say, uh, solving those MCQs on the Telegram app. Okay. But that please don't be hooked to the Telegram app. Once you can just give half an hour or something if required that too. Okay. I'm very scared. Huh? So please scared in the context your time is very precious okay so it's such a very important time so please use it very effectively okay right so okay right so now let's get on into the discussion of the subject you see ma'am yeah. this was so just incidentally i happened to discuss with you the standards over here no we were looking at the nfra order but while looking at the nfra order we happened to look at these provisions over here right so now what we will do okay fiscal laws right so now you are mentioning mcqs after exams okay right so yeah after the exams you can put the mcqs over here you know whatever mcqs remain in your mind so that it can help the further students also and this you can just make a compilation by putting it over here that would be great okay but also prepare for your law paper before doing any such activity okay right oh my god three students four students have mentioned fiscal law it's like you know you are like oh, it's decided that we discuss fiscal law next okay right so let's have agenda now let's discuss the fiscal law and then after that uh, let us discuss a little bit of caro ethics and then let me come to a few important questions over there as regard the questions in the rtp mtp and the amendments i have taken a few revision series the knockout you know the audit knockout series i have taken in the end of april so those videos are there on youtube so if required on a very fast forward mode you can just quickly look through them if required okay so now all of you with me how do I come to know that you are really with me? How do I come to know? 
ट्रिक्स अरे ट्रिक्स क्या हो भी ट्रिक एक ही है किसी ये बन जाओ फुल 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 लाइफ विल बी ट्रिकी ओनली ओके जस्ट अ फ्यू डेज अवे फ्रॉम यू गेटिंग द प्रेफिक्स ये बिफोर योर नेम वेन आर चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट्स एक्ट यू विल बी गवर्न बाई दी प्रोविजन ऑफ दी चार्टर्ड अकाउंटेंट्स एक्ट ओके एंड मैम एट द एंड विथ चैप्टर टू स्टार्ट विथ तो स्टार्ट विथ पी एस यू देन डू डू डिलीजेंस इन्वेस्टिगेशन फॉरेंसिक ऑडिट एवरीथिंग इज योर्स ओनली वेदर नाउ और लेटर यू हैव टू स्टडी इट मतलब ऐसा टाइम नहीं काम है सोचने को कि कहाँ से शुरू करें क्या करें भाई लग जाओ काम पे यू डोंट हैव द टाइम टू थिंक You get my point. Breathing is natural. That is why you are breathing. Otherwise, honestly speaking, you don't even have time to breathe, because it is automated heart beating and breathing and everything that is happening. Otherwise, you should be unconscious of the uh, world, you know, at this point of time. Okay. Uh, all the standards. Okay. How audit. Okay. Right. So, anyways, I think let me just keep. myself away from the dis- uh, distraction of the chat box and let's discuss the fiscal laws over here okay right so when we come to fiscal laws one we need to discuss the applicability of the tax audit okay which assessees are required to get the tax audit done so one it says if the assessees are in business then if their turnover of the business exceeds the 1 crore or for assessees who are in the profession if their receipts in the profession exceed rupees 50 lakh however if more than 95% of the receipts and payments are through the banking channel more than 95% of the receipts and payments are through the banking channel then the limit for the applicability of the tax audit is by 10 crore instead of the 1 crore this is available 10 crore ka benefit only for the assessees who are in the business not available for the assessees who are in the profession it is only for the assessees who are in the business like recently in one rtp they put a question that there is an engineering consultancy firm and that the engineering consultancy firm has 8 crore revenue and they are saying that more than 95% of our receipts and payment are through banking channel and that is why the 10 crore limit of applicability of tax audit is applicable to us not at क्योंकि वो एसएससी इन प्रोफेशन है एसएससी इन प्रोफेशन के लिए लिमिट 50 लाख है जो 10 करोड़ का बेनिफिट है दैट इज ओनली फॉर द एसएससी इन द बिजनेस इफ मोर देन 97 95% ऑफ द रिसीट्स एंड पेमेंट्स आर थ्रू द बैंकिंग चैनल राइट सो दैट्स वन रिगार्डिंग द एप्लीकेबिलिटी ऑफ द टैक्स ऑडिट राइट दैट्स वन रिगार्डिंग द एप्लीकेबिलिटी ऑफ द टैक्स ऑडिट देन आफ्टर दैट वी हैव अ वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट डिस्कशन ओवर देयर द आईसीडीएस द इनकम कंप्यूटेशन एंड द डिस्क्लोजर स्टैंडर्ड्स वन सुपर फेवरेट क्वेश्चन ऑफ द आईसीएआई द इनकम कंप्यूटेशन एंड द डिस्क्लोजर स्टैंडर्ड्स राइट सो इनकम कंप्यूटेशन एंड द डिस्क्लोजर स्टैंडर्ड्स आर टू बी फॉलोड बाय द एसएससीज व्हाइल कैलकुलेटिंग देयर इनकम फ्रॉम द पीजीबीपी प्रॉफिट्स एंड गेन्स फ्रॉम बिजनेस ऑफ प्रोफेशन एंड द इनकम फ्रॉम द अदर सोर्सेज to be followed by those assessees who are following the mercantile system of accounting and not to be followed by the assessees who are following the cash system of the accounting and there are the 10 icds 1 to 10 which have been released by the what you say the central government over there right the icds which have been notified and then where in the form 3cd do you need to do the reporting of icds let me see where in the form 3 cd you need to do the reporting that whether the assessee has followed the icds in clause yes mercantile pgbp ios super in clause third oh i said it okay in clause clause 13 d e and f what is 13 d right 13d is regarding whether any adjustment is required to be done in order to comply with the icds then the details of the adjustment and then the disclosures as per the icds then the disclosures as per the icds right so this is regarding the income computation and the disclosure standards right the income computation and the disclosure standards to be followed by assessees while using the pgbp computing income from pgbp and ios and then to be followed by those assessees who are following the mercantile system of accounting and not the cash system of accounting and then form 3c d you do the reporting under clause 13 d e and f okay right then after that now let us come to the form 3 cd what is the care you will take while filling furnishing the particulars in the form 3 cd 
right what points are to be taken care of while furnishing the particulars in form 3 cd if any particular clause is not applicable to the ssc you need to specifically mention that the clause is not applicable right then any particular item of income or expenses coming in more than one clause then suitable cross references are to be given right then the suitable cross references are to be given like you know depreciation will come in clause 18 also depreciation will come in clause 32 also depreciation allowance so it says the suitable cross references are to be given then if there is difference in the views of the auditor and the assessee what does it say both the views are required to be furnished okay assessee says this uh, allowed and the auditor says this allowed so what does it say both the views are required to be furnished right then the details have to be filled as per the latest provisions of the act the details have to be filled as per the books of account right the details as per the books of account if you've taken into consideration any judicial pronouncement even the reference to the juni judicial pronouncement should be the right the reference to the judicial pronouncement should also be done and then after that what does it say in case if you don't get any part of the information no need for you to withhold the entire report no need to withhold the entire report you can qualify and issue the audit report you can qualify and issue the audit report right so these are the points to be kept in mind while furnishing the particulars in the form 3cd right these are the points to be kept in mind while furnishing the particulars in the form 3cd okay right and now let's look into the form 3cd right in the form 3cd very interesting we have over there is the clause 4 what is clause 4 whether the assessee is liable to pay any indirect taxes like gst customs service tax and so then the registration number gst registration number or any other identification number allotted for the same right so whether the assessee is liable to pay any indirect taxes so say there is the assessee and he also has a gst registration number so now under clause 4 of form 3cd you have to give down serial number indirect tax law and the registration number right the gst registration number so if many gst registration number then you need to make a table over there right so indirect tax and the registration number so in order to make it co more uh, relatable let me just open the a question bank for tax audits so that simultaneously we can look at a few questions so that you can have a better revision just give me a moment till the time i open the file hmm. and any particular clause also if you want it to be discussed you can mention it over there theek hai na verification of deposits bank audit huh? do it properly then what information is to be provided to the auditor right in the when the client is operating in an automated environment even that question you need to study it properly okay right so anyways now over you are coming to this question regarding the clause 4 of the form 3cd what does it say Right. B is a renowned criminal lawyer practicing in Lucknow. During the previous year, he collected GST of 25 lakh but did not deposit. And he is telling the proceedings are pending. He instructed his tax auditor not to disclose the GST registration number while filling the particulars under clause 4 of form 3CD. So no, we will report. So what is the format of the answer? Reporting requirements under clause 4 of form 3CD under which you write down the facts of the case. under which you write down the facts of the case then you write down the provisions and explanation a tax auditor is required to report under clause 4 of form 3cd whether the ssc has to you know pay liable to pay any indirect taxes like excise service tax sales customs duty etc right then the reporting has to be done and then the auditor needs to obtain the written representations from the management therefore the tax auditor is required to furnish the detail and the contention of the management is not attainable right the content of the management is not tenable right then again the company applied for gst registration so again you need to say that the tax auditor should verify the registration number right of the locations for which registrations have not been received from the online portal so if they have not yet obtained the gst registration certificates then you can verify it from the online portal right so that is regarding the clause 4 of the form 3c d then you also have the clause 30 41 right you have the clause 41 what is clause 41 it is regarding the demand raised or refund issued it is regarding the demand raised or the 
refund issued under any tax laws other than the income tax act or the wealth tax act so other than income tax act and wealth tax act that means the indirect tax laws so demand raised or refund issued under any tax laws other than the income tax act or the wealth tax act right so any you know what you say service tax gst any demand going on over there right so again that needs to be reported under clause 41 of the form 3c d right the clause 41 of the form 3c d right so this is we just go through the entire form uh, 3c d also but right now if i want to show you a question on the right clause 41 look over here yes what does it say Right, clause 41, demand notice of so much was received from the provisions of Central Excise Act. As a tax auditor, how would you report on the same? Right, so again, reporting requirement under clause 41 of Form 3CD. Right, so you write down the facts of the case. Then provisions and explanation as per clause 41 of Form 3CD, 3CD, the tax auditor should furnish the details of the demand raised or the refund issued. Therefore, the tax auditor should obtain a copy of all the demand refund orders. It may be related to a period other than the relevant previous year also and then it says the reporting has to be done in the following format right so what is that that is the yes clause 41 of the form 3 cd right then after that you have so let's see two three times there is a question regarding the clause 41 then recently there was a question asked regarding the clause 42 of the form 3 cd what is clause 42 of the form 3 cd whether the assessee is liable to furnish a return under form 60 one sixty one a and the sixty one b. Now, when is the assessee required to furnish the return under form sixty one? When the assessee is in receipt of form sixty. When the receiver of form sixty has to file form sixty one. Who is receiver of form sixty? A person who what is form sixty? A person who does not have a pan. Wait, if I want to enter into a ten lakh rupee transaction with another party, so obviously ten lakh rupee transaction that means more than the. 2 lakh rupees. So, obviously, I require the PAN of the other party. The other party says, I don't have a PAN. So, then I say, you give me a declaration in Form 60. So, who am I? I am a receiver of Form 60. Who am I? I am a receiver of Form 60. And the receiver of Form 60 has to file Form 61. Receiver of Form 60 has to file the Form 61. Right? So, you need to give the details of the transaction. Next one, 61A, which is regarding the specified financial transactions of more than 10 lakh, like buyback of shares or so. Right? So, if the SSE has entered into any specified financial transaction, then the SSE needs to file the Form 61A. And 61B, whether the SSE has to comply with the provisions of the FATCA, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Right, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act. Okay. Right. So, what does it say? The other party was required to quote the PAN. However, the taxpayer has obtained the declaration in Form 60 where the other party has not furnished the PAN. Right. So, what does it say? The taxpayer has received declarations in Form 60. And right? so, you're a receiver of Form 60, you have to file the Form 61. And then 61A is regarding the specified financial transactions under 2485BA. Right. Specified transactions like issue of bonds, issue of shares, buyback of shares by listed company these transactions may not happen every year and hence attention should be given in the year when the taxpayer issues any security or a listed company undertakes any buyback of the shares and then verifying the same the auditor needs to verify the detail and the reporting is to be done as under right so that is anyways regarding the clause as regarding the clause 42 of the form 3c d okay right so now as such if we look into the 41 clauses of the 44 clauses of the form 3c d right what is clause 1 it is regarding the name of the assessee 2 right clause 1 name of the assessee 2 the address 3 the pan 4 we just discussed indirect tax and the registration number 5 status 6 and 7 previous year and the assessment year 8 the relevant clause of 44 ab under which the tax audit is being conducted okay if you're turnover exceeding 1 crore or 10 crore or receipts more than 50 lakh or are you paying what you say lower than the presumptive rates of taxation why is tax audit applicable to you under which clause of 44 ab is the tax audit being applicable right then partners and their profit sharing ratio and the business or profession if the assessee is engaged in more than one business or profession the nature of every business or profession right so that is clause 1 to 10 then after that you have clause 11 which is regarding the What is clause 11? I'm coming to 29 and 31 RT. Welcome to that. Okay. Yes. 
what is clause 11 it is regarding the hmm, hmm. yes it is also whether the SSE has opted for the ta not optional taxation scheme okay yes so clause 11 books of account yes the books of account being maintained by the SSE the list of books of account and also the address where the books of account have been maintained right then the presumptive taxation whether the SSE is paying any tax on the presumptive basis 13 method of accounting right so whether there has been any change in the method of accounting and the effect of such change and I also told you 13 VEF income computation and disclosure standards comes over here right then 14 method of valuation of closing stock and whether there has been any change in the method of valuation of closing stock then whether any capital asset has been converted into the stock in trade whether any capital asset has been converted into the stock in trade 16 is super important amounts not credited to the profit and loss account so what is your income you have not disclosed it as an income so now tax auditor will report it under the clause 16 of the form 3c d right he will report it under clause 16 of the form 3c d what does it say the escalation claims the amounts to charge items under section 28 which is the pgbp the charging section Right, any drawbacks, credits and refunds which have been admitted as due by the authorities. Right, so here it talks about the escalation claim under 16C. You know, amounts not credited to PNL. Right, amounts which have not been credited. So what does it say for that? You need to check whether the escalation claim has been accepted. Then if they are following cash basis of accounting, then this will not come. But if they are following mercantile system, then the escalation claim should be accounted for. And only making of a claim is not an accepted claim. Also, other party should have given the unconditional acceptance. Right, the other party should have given the unconditional acceptance. Okay. Right. Then after that, what does it say? Capital receipts. What are the examples of capital receipts under 16E? Right. So capital subsidy in the form of government grant. Then government grant for the purchase of a specific fixed asset. Then compensation for surrendering certain rights or profit on sale of the fixed assets or investment to the extent not credited to the profit and loss account. Okay. Right. So that is regarding the capital receipts. What is this? This is the clause. 16. What is clause 16? Amounts not credited to PNL. So they should have been shown as your income, but they have not been shown as your income. So that is why now you need to report them, right? That is why the tax auditor will report them over here. Amounts not credited to the PNL. That means you are showing less income than your true income. Okay. Right. Items falling within the scope of section 28. Then pro forma credit drawback refund of due, which has been admitted as due by the authorities. Recently, there was a case study made on this one. And then escalation claims accepted during the previous year. Any other item of income and capital receipt of any. We just discussed about the capital receipt. Okay. Then after that, 17 is regarding the land or building or both have been transferred, sold during the previous year at less than the government valuation, at less than the stamp duty value. And generally, if I have a land whose value is 10 crore, like say the, what you say, stamp duty value is 10 crore, actually the deal takes place at say 15 crore. Okay, but now 10 crore is the value of the land as per the stamp paper and the deal has been done for 4 crore. Right? So, it is loss of capital gains for the income tax department. That is why, what does it say? You need to do the reporting. Land or building have been transferred at less than government valuation. Right. 18 is regarding depreciation. If I have purchased the asset in cash, will I get the benefit of depreciation? I purchased. I purchased a laptop by giving cash. Will I get the benefit of it? So depreciation in that case? No. If the asset is purchased in cash, can I get the benefit of depreciation? No. Right. So depreciation. So you need to give that block of depreciation, those details over there, right? Block of asset and so. Right. 19 is regarding weighted deductions, which is outdated now. Now there is no weighted deductions and all of that. Right. 20 is regarding amount which is payable to the employee as profit or dividend has been given to him as bonus or commission. So what was your appropriation of profit? You showed it as a charge against profit. You had to give it as a profit to the, as an appropriation of profit, but you showed it as bonus or commission. And the employee contribution to the various funds. And an employee contribution, labor welfare fund, superannuation fund, employee contribution, whether it has been transferred or no. Okay, right. So that is 11 to 20. Then after that, you have 21. What is 21? Amounts debited to PNL. Le or dala PNL. 
anything what picked up and dropped into profit out the profit and loss account what you dropped in profit and loss account club services facility club subscription then personal expenditure then souvenir brochure tacked off the political party advertisement made over there penalty or fine paid capital expenditure amounts without deducting tds tds not deducted not paid tds deducted but not paid right what are you doing everything taking it up picking it up and putting it to profit and loss account class 21 says all this self and then very important one in 21 payments in excess of the 10,000 being made by other than account pay check or the account pay draft again this allowed right 21 d a and 21 d b and the payments in excess of the 10,000 other than by account pay check or the account pay draft, right? So you have the 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Please furnish the details of the amount deb, 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 debited to, 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 debited to the profit and loss account, being in the nature of capital, personal advertisement, expenditure, etc. So capital expenditure, personal expenditure, political party advertisement, then fees, entrance fee, subscription, club services, facility, penalty, fine any other penalty or fine then which is an offense prohibited by, or which is prohibited by law then payments without deducting tds right tds not deducted not paid tds deducted but not paid you know so tds has not been deducted tds has been deducted but it has not been paid right then after that you have the amounts debited to pnl being the interest salary bonus commission which is inadmissible then the disallowance deemed income 21 d a and 21 d b payments in excess of the 10000 being made by other than account pay check or the account pay draft okay right then provision for payment of gratuity then any some paid by the SSE as an employer then contingency nature recently they asked a question on this one 21 h what is 21 h see your total income also has some agricultural income now agricultural income is exempt from the payment of the taxes okay and now for earning that agriculture income you incur such some expenditure now that expenditure should it be allowed as an expenditure under the income tax law no it should not be allowed as an expenditure under the income tax law why because the income is exempt so that is why the expenditure should be disallowed under the income tax law so amount of deduction inadmissible in terms of section 14a in respect of the expenditure incurred in relation to income which does not form part of the total income right so that is 21 h and then you have the 21 i which is the 36 1 3 okay right then recently a question asked on this one also 22 interest to msmed suppliers right the interest paid to msmed suppliers again not allowed as a deduction under the income tax law right so any interest paid so if you make a late payment to msmed supplier you need to pay the interest is that interest allowed as an expenditure under the income tax law no it is not allowed as an expenditure so interest payable to the msmed suppliers then payments of particulars of payments made to a specified persons 40 a to b that is your related parties right then amounts deemed to be profits and gains under 32 a c 30 then the 33 and so tea coffee rubber and the allowances or so right then amount profit uh, amount of profit chargeable under uh, section 41 what is this you said oh this debtor is bad this debtor is not going to pay so what do you do you write off and that you claim it as an expense but later on debtor paid so the recovery of bad debt, it says pay, in, pay income tax. And you pay income tax. That's why they say, okay, whenever you give an ice cream to a small child, you should always eat 30% of their ice cream. Why? Right? Because so that they are, you know, used to, accustomed to paying the taxes. You they know, okay, entire 100% ice cream, I cannot eat 30%, I'll have to give. So later on when they earn also. And so you say, first you said it will be bad debt. So that is why it was allowed as an expenditure. Now the debtor paid recovery of bad debt. So income tax department says 30%. 30 35 percent whatever it is right so any amount of profit chargeable to tax right then 26 what is 26 it is regarding the 43b payments and there's certain deductions which are allowed only on the actual payment basis right so what does it say pre-existed on the first day but was not allowed in the assessment for any preceding year and whether it was paid during the year not paid during the year and was incurred so it was pre-existed means this was your opening balance and this was incurred in the previous year or paid on or before the due date for furnishing the return of income and not paid on or before the aforesaid date 
okay for this how they made your life very interesting in the mcq they asked okay there is a gst liability example which was payable by the sse as on the opening of the year and it has not been paid during the year so whether it will be reported under 26 a a whether it will be reported under 26 a b whether it will be reported under 26 b a or whether it will be reported under 26 B B. अभी क्या करने का जब ऐसा कुछ आता है पेपर में तो हम्म वॉट दे आर सेंग इट एग्जिस्टेड ऑन द फर्स्ट डे ऑफ द प्रीवियस ईयर एंड हाउ एवर इट वॉज नॉट पेड ड्यूरिंग द प्रीवियस ईयर ऑल्सो सो वेर इट विल कम इट विल कम अंडर ट्वेंटी सिक्स बी नो 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 ट्वेंटी सिक्स ए Yes, 26A, B, correct? B is the correct option over here. Okay. Do we need to quote clause number also while giving answer? If you know it, then you quote it. If you don't know, then write as per the relevant provisions of Form 3CD. Kya kare na? Be one day before exam, how much to remember? Okay, few days anyways. Hai na? So, yes. Now let's come further, right? Yes. So then that's regarding the uh, the outstanding liabilities and 43B payments. Certain deductions are allowed only on the actual payment basis. Okay. Right. Then send back credit and the prior period items, right? So prior period items credited debited to the PNL. So again, for that prior period item will come only in case of the mercantile system. It will not come in case of the cash system of the accounting. Right. Then 28, you receive shares without consideration or for inadequate consideration. So receive shares of a company in which public are not substantially interested either without consideration or for inadequate consideration. 29, you receive consideration for issue of shares which exceeds the fair market value. Receive consideration for issue of shares which exceeds the fair market value. Okay, right. So 56 to 7A, 56 to 7B and then you have 56 to 9 and 56 to 10. Right. What is 5629? It is regarding the forfeit. Yes, what does it say? The forfeiture of the advance received towards the transfer of a capital asset. Right. Forfeiture of the advance received towards the transfer of the capital asset. Right. So you received an ad advance for the transfer of a particular asset. For some reason, the deal got cancelled. The deal got cancelled. That is why you had to put the uh, advance which you got, you did not return it. You forfeited it. Right. So now income tax department, what does it say? Give us 30%. Give us 30% out of that, right? So, for feature of advance received towards the transfer of the capital asset, right? For feature of advance received towards the transfer of the capital asset. 29B is regarding the gifts received, okay? Right, then 30 amount borrowed on any kundi. Then 30A, any primary adjustment to transfer price. Okay, excess payment has been done outside India. Then the details of the excess payment and whether the excess money has been repatriated to India whether it has been repatriated within the prescribed time if not then what is the imputed interest income on the same right so what does it say the primary adjustment if any under 92 ce right then 30 b is regarding the limitation on the interest deduction up to 30 percent of ebitda interest deduction is allowed more than 30 percent of ebitda you need to carry it forward to the further years Right? So, 30% of the EBITDA, limitation on the interest deduction. However, applicable only when the interest amount is of more than 1 crore. 30C, whether the SSE has entered into any impermissible avoidance arrangement. Impermissible avoidance arrangement, double taxation avoidance agreement that time. Right? So, whether the SSE has entered into any impermissible avoidance agreement. Right? So, that is the 30C. Okay. Right? So, that is 21 to 30. Amounts debited to PNL. Then the Yes, uh, interest to MSMED suppliers, payment to specified persons, then the, the yes, payments to specified persons, then after that you have to 32, 33, then the section 41, then the 43B payments, send back credit prior period items, receive shares, receive consideration for issue of shares, then the forfeiture of advance, then the gifts received, then amount borrowed on any hundi, then after that the primary adjustment, then the limitation on interest deduction and the impermissible avoidance arrangement and the impermissible avoidance arrangement okay and now coming to 31 to 40 what is 31 it is regarding the 
Act 31, it is regarding the loan accepted or repaid of more than 20,000 other than by account pay check or account pay draft. Loan accepted or repaid of more than 20,000 other than by account pay check, account pay draft or the ECS. Right. So, loan accepted or loan repaid. Right. So, what does it say? Taken or accepted of more than 20,000. Then any specified sum taken or accepted. And then you have BA, BB, BC and BD. Right. This is a new one. Trend a lot of questions coming in the exam and also in the RTP, MTP for this one. Right? So, you have BA, BB, BC and the BD. What is it? Receipts in excess of the 2 lakh and payments in excess of the 2 lakh for a single event occasion to a single person. Right? So, receipts in cash of more than 2 lakh received by check or draft which is not an account pay check or draft of more than 2 lakh then payments in cash of more than 2 lakh or payments by check or draft which is not an account pay check or draft of more than 2 lakh right so this is a very important one over there the 31 ba bb bc and the bd right so they say there is a event management company and flower decoration and light decoration has been done and they have received 4 lakh rupees in cash you say oh my god receipts in cash and of more than 2 lakh in cash. So, the reporting will come under 31BA of the Form 3CD. 31B A of the form 3C D. Each receipt in an amount exceeding the limit specified under 269 ST in aggregate from a person in a day in respect of a single transaction or in respect. Now see from a person in a day. One or in respect of a single transaction. Two or in respect of transactions relating to one event or occasion from a person. During the previous year, where such receipt is otherwise done by check, draft or the ECS through a bank account. Then what does it say? NAP, the name, address, PAN or other, nature of the transaction, amount of receipt and the date of receipt. Right? So, name, address, PAN. Right? So, NAP. Right, the nature of transaction, amount of receipt and the date of receipt. And if it is by check or draft, which is not an account pay check or account pay draft, then only the name, address and the amount of receipt. Then nature and date need not be given. If it is by check or draft, if it is in cash, then you also need to give the nature and the date. Okay, this is receipt and then BC and BD is regarding the payment. Okay, right, then this is regarding the repayment of more than 20,000 other than by account pay check or account pay draft. However, these details are not to be given in case of the loan taken from any government, government company, banking company or corporation established under the acts. Okay, right, then 32 is regarding the brought forward loss, depreciation allowance and the speculation loss. Any changes in the shareholding, any speculation loss which has been incurred, speculation business and speculation loss. Right? So, 32 is regarding the speculation loss, depreciation allowance and so. So, 31 loan accepted or repaid of more than 20,000 receipts and payments in excess of 2 lakh. That is 31. Right? 32 brought forward loss, depreciation allowance. 33 is the standard deductions. 34 the TDS and the TCS. 35 is the quantitative details. This is a favorite one again. Quantitative details in case of a trading concern and in case of a manufacturing concern. So, in case of a trading concern and in case of a manufacturing concern, raw material finished products. Right. So, 35, it is regarding the quantitative details in case of a trading concern and in case of a manufacturing concern. 36 has been omitted. However, you have 36A, which is regarding the deemed dividend. Right. So, whether SSE is in receipt of any deemed dividend. Right. 37, 38 and 39 is regarding the cost audit, excise audit and the service tax audit. So, whether any of these audits have been carried out and there is any disagreement or disqualification on any item, matter, value, quantity as may be identified or reported by the auditor. Right? 40 is regarding the accounting ratios in the form 3CD. Consay accounting ratios, which are the accounting ratios? Gross profit to total turnover of the SSE, then gross profit to turnover, net profit to turnover, stock in trade to turnover and material consumed to finished goods produced. Right? So, that's the accounting ratios in the form 3CD. And then after that, you have the 41, which is demand raised or refund issued under any tax law other than the Income Tax Act or the Wealth Tax Act. Then you have the 42, form 61, 61A and the 61B. Right? Then you have 43, which are the assessee is required to furnish the report under 286.2, the CBCR, country by country report. 
you know, so the parent entity, the alternate reporting entity and so, right, so country by country report and then you have the breakup of the total expenditure of entities which are registered under the GST, which are under the composition scheme and which are not registered under the GST, right, the breakup of the total expenditure. Okay, so basically when you are now revising the chapter of the fiscal laws, you need to look into three areas. One, the applicability of the tax audit. Second, you need to look into the income computation and the disclosure standards. And third, you need to study the 44 clauses of the form 3CD. Yes, are we good? All good everyone? Did you listen to me? Today, so ma'am, we have to listen to you. Okay, right. So now let's proceed further. Tell me, what is the process of forensic accounting? Jaldi, jaldi batao. If you don't write clause but correctly write the provision of clause, then marks milling in a mil jayenge. Jo idhar likha hai, wo kahi nahi jayega. Okay, don't worry, you'll get but less marks, but you'll get. Okay. Hmm. No, kitna, say, dil abhi masum ho jata na, say, tit, 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 say. no problem, normal, normal process, this is work in progress of becoming a chartered accountant, I know, so it thoughts auto aate hai na, hum bulte ma'am, kya kare ye, na, say, ho jata hai, good, good, Aray, lifetime chartered accountancy degree, kya must life hogi tumhari, so it's worth it, you know, Yes, tell me the process of forensic accounting. How to remember all the clauses of Form 3CD? At least remember the important ones. Okay. So you can just uh, look into the question bank and accordingly decide their relevance. Hmm. I'm waiting. I'm waiting to receive an answer. Process of forensic accounting. What is the process? So you'll say, ma'am, all of a sudden, how you can ask? Are now day after ICI is it going to ask you systematically? It is going to ask you now all of a sudden. Hmm. So initialization, correct. First, you need to initialize. That is, you need to know the utility, the objective, the scope of the audit. Right. Then once you know the initialization, then based on that, you develop your plan. Right, so initialization, right, then after the initialization, based on the initialization, you develop the plan, then based on the plan, you obtain the evidence, then based on the evidence, on the evidence obtained, you perform the analysis, right, you perform the analysis, then on the, and based on the analysis performed, you do the reporting, and because it is forensic audit, you don't stop over here, further what you do? Further, what you do, you also do the use it in the court proceedings because what is forensic, which can be used on or before the forum. Like in an audit, we get persuasive evidence. In an investigation, we get the conclusive evidence. In a forensic accounting, we get the we get the legal evidence and then evidence which can be used in the courts of law. And now they say, ha, huh, you should not use the word forensic audit. Everywhere they call it as forensic accounting. So okay, forensic accounting to accounting. Okay, perform analysis. How do you you perform the analysis again a retail question specific question asked in your exams summarizing a large number of transactions calculating the economic damages then also calculating the present value right calculating then performing the regression sensitivity analysis then utilizing the charts and graphics to explain the analysis utilizing the spreadsheets right tables and spreadsheets right so that's performing the analysis then how do you do the reporting it says reporting is the final stage of the fraud audit the auditor should report in his uh, report regarding how the fraudster set up the fraud scheme what was the amount of fraud involved which were the parties involved and so right then also what does it say the report should be based on facts and nothing else you know it should the report should be based on facts and for that the forensic auditor accountant should be having the active listening skills you should be having the active listening skills, okay. And then the proceedings can be used in the courts of law, okay. Right, then after that, then you tell me, okay, what are the forensic audit techniques? What are the forensic audit techniques? Yes, one, you have the general audit techniques, right? Then after that, you have the statistical mathematical techniques, right? Then after that, you have the computer assisted audit techniques. Right. Then after that, you have the generalized audit software, then the common software tool, right? Then the technology based digital forensic techniques, 
then the data mining techniques and the laboratory analysis of the physical and electronic evidences right the laboratory analysis of the physical and electronic evidences okay right retail question in the exams regarding these ones technology based digital forensic techniques what are the technology based digital forensic techniques what does it say every transaction in today's modern computer driven society leaves a digital footprint right digital footprint so it says a close scrutiny of the hard disk phone log email is the requisite of any modern forensic audit right so now when i am going to check somebody's phone or i am going to check somebody's email or i am going to check into somebody's hard disk it will lead to invasion of privacy so before doing the invasion into the privacy you need to seek the legal advice and now you say ma'am i don't know how to crack somebody's phone or not crack means literally crack but how to crack somebody's uh, pa account or password or something so you may have to take the help of the trained digital investigators and nowadays a lot of open source forensic tools are also available okay technology based digital forensic techniques okay yes were you able to recall it when i was discussing it with you yes okay next one data mining techniques what does it say mining large volume of data right you do the mining of the large volume of the data to find out the new hidden or the unexpected information right you can do the discovery predictive modeling or the sensitivity analysis right then what does it say without any predefined idea without any preconditioned hypothesis about the existence of the fraud you do the analysis of the data Right, so you do the analysis of the data, right? So that's the data mining techniques, and then also you have the laboratory analysis of the physical. So you have the computer forensics and also the yes, what you say, the laboratory evidences. Okay, right. So this is regarding the forensic audit techniques, right? The techniques that may be used in the forensic audit. Okay, right. Then after that, tell me regarding the standards of financial propriety, the norms of financial propriety. financial propriety the trans expenditure should be in accordance with the publicly accepted largely accepted customs and so right so now tell me what are is there should be no you know unnecessary irregularity you know in the expenditure improper avoidable and wasteful expenditure so public financial morality by looking into the wisdom faithfulness and the economy of the transaction so what are the norms of financial propriety standards principles of financial propriety expenditure should not be prima facie more than what the occasion demands so if the occasion demands you to purchase only one laptop no need for you to purchase 1000 laptops right so expenditure should not be prima facie more than what the occasion demands then no authority should exercise power which is directly or indirectly to its own advantage and no authority should exercise power which is directly or indirectly to its own advantage then public money should not be utilized for the benefit of a particular community or section of the society and the public money it's the public fund so it should not be utilized for the benefit of a particular person or section or community of the society and the allowance given to the government employee should not be a source of profit to the recipients the allowance is given to the government employees they should not be a other income avenue of profits for the employees of the government right they should not be a source of the profit what are these these are the standards of the financial propriety right these are the principles of the financial propriety okay what are the contents of the audit report of cnag three times question asked in your exams contents of the audit report of the c and ag one yes four points over there exam mein aise hi hoga na you will be seeing a question over there contents of audit report of cnag and then you have to write down yes first content in the audit report of cnag introduction containing a general review of the public undertaking second one results of those public undertakings which have been taken up for appraisal by the audit board then results of those undertakings which have not been taken up for appraisal by the audit board 
and then after that also it says the resume of the company audit report and the resume resume means the extract of that much part of the audit report where any supplementary audit report or so has been issued by the cnag right supplementary audit in case of government company cnag has the power to conduct the supplementary audit so resume of the company auditors report right so what are those those are the contents of the audit reports of the cnag those are the contents of the audit report of the cnag G. okay what is the eligibility to be a peer reviewer right eligibility to be a peer reviewer right peer reviewer what is the eligibility at least seven years of the assurance practice experience earlier it was assurance audit experience now what does it say at least seven years of the assurance practice experience right then what does it say it has undergone the requisite training and cleared the requisite test and has given the declaration as prescribed by the board has also given the declaration of the confidentiality right then last two years have not done has had any professional assignment with the practice unit and next two years also won't be accepting any professional assignment from the practice unit and in case if the review of what you say the chartered accountant has moved from industry to practice then what does it say at least 10 years of industry experience and three years of the audit experience three years of the practical or no assurance practice experience right so that's the eligibility to be a peer review work right that's the eligibility to be a peer reviewer tell me the peer review reporting process the reporting stage under peer review the reporting stage under the peer review right so what does it say if there are no findings of the reviewer then he will directly issue the peer review report to the peer review board and then a copy of the report will also be submitted to the practice unit and then the peer review board will issue the peer review certificate however in case if the peer, there are a, a findings regarding that the systems and procedures at the practice unit are not adequate then what does it say the peer review the reviewer will issue the preliminary report to the practice unit to with a copy of the report to the peer review board so preliminary report then what does it say the practice unit has to give the response to the preliminary report within 2 days then two things may happen the reviewer is satisfied with the responses or the reviewer is not satisfied with the responses if the reviewer is satisfied with the responses then what does it say he will issue the final report to the peer review board along with a copy to the practice unit and then the peer review board will issue the peer review certificate if the reviewer is not satisfied then he will issue a qualified report to the peer review board along with a copy to the practice unit and then the peer review board may order a follow on review to be conducted after 6 months to 1 year and a follow on review to be conducted after 6 months to 1 year are you understanding that right so peer review the reporting stage under the peer review process right the reporting stage under the peer review process what are the liabilities of the auditor under the income tax act you'll say ma'am icci would be better than you you the way you are going around from one question to another so preparing you for the worst you know so the tomorrow day after whatever comes in the paper easy cake cook for you you'll get 60 for me in audit i know hmm okay sir pre now i need to roll my sleeves and now i need to start studying the subject in the message cut up it is a charged up on aj 100% battery charge with a low battery no 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 Yes, tell me what liabilities of the auditor under the income tax act. Yes, section. Hmm, I'm I'm not able to hear you. तुम दिल से बोलोगे ना तो आवाज मुझ तक पहुँच जाएगी. If you really say no, then I the voice will reach to me. But half-heartedly, then the voice will not reach to me. say admit no admit no no not fair not acceptable liabilities of the auditor under the income tax act 1961 one what does it say ca generally are you allowed to represent client before the taxation authority yes are why you are telling company act re baba that is civil and criminal liability under company act i am asking under income tax act liabilities under the income tax act 
right generally is a ce allowed to represent client before the taxation authority yes but it says this ce not allowed to represent client before the taxation authority why because he's been dismissed from government services he's become insolvent or he has been convicted of an offense under the income tax law or he has been you know or guilty of professional misconduct by icai or he has been order has been passed by the court that for and he is being uh, involved in an offense involving fraud then it says such a chartered accountant not to represent the client before the income tax authority right then now this ca he is inducing his client to submit the false documents to the income tax authorities he is telling client petrol bill hotel bill travel bill all fake all fake bills you submit to the income tax authority you know so inducing or supporting his client to submit the false documents to the income tax authorities documents which he knows to be false or which he does not believe to be true which he knows to be false or he does not believe to be true then what does it say which would lead to tax evasion of more than 2500000 or less than 2500000 if more than 2500000 then what does it say rigorous imprisonment which will not be less than 6 months which may extend up to 7 years and with a fine and in other cases if the tax evasion is of less than 2500000 then minimum imprisonment of 3 months which may extend up to 2 years and with a fine right so that is 278 so much case study coming in the exam on this one and regarding 278 false documents to the income tax authority you know false when you are representing the client giving the false documents to the income tax authorities then you have the rule 12a while representing the client before the assessing officer you are giving the false information regarding the assessing that's a false information to the assessing officer so again imprisonment up to 7 years and a fine right and then after that you have the two section uh, section 271j by furnishing any report or certificate gives any incorrect information in the report or certificate what does it say 10000 rupees by way of penalty for each such incorrect report or certificate right 10 uh, is in 10000 rupees as penalty for each such incorrect report or certificate is it clear to all of you liabilities of the auditor under the income tax act 1961 okay right then after that tell me section 147 of the companies act section 147 punishment for non compliance yes punishment for the non compliance who has not complied who has not complied punishment for the non compliance company has not complied with what section 139 to section 146 both inclusive right of the companies act 2013 then what does it say company shall be liable to a penalty which is company shall be liable to a fine which shall not be less than 25000 which may extend up to 5 lakh rupees and every officer of the company shall be liable to a fine of less than 10000 which may extend up to 1 lakh and if the auditor of the company has not complied with section 139 144 or 145 and the appointment of the auditor auditor not to render certain services or auditor to sign the audit report auditor of the company has not complied with then what does it say auditor he will be liable to pay a fine of 25000 rupees of which may extend up to 5 lakh rupees or four times the remuneration of the auditor whichever is less and is the auditor of the company willfully knowingly deliberately he knows i should not allow first year article to sign audit report fir bhi kiya allow first year article ko report sign karne ke liye gone then what does it say fine of not less than 50000 which may extend up to 25 lakh rupees or eight times the remuneration of the auditor whichever is less and now they are very angry with this chartered accountant because chartered accountant knowingly willfully has not complied with the requirements of 139 144 145 145. then what does it say auditor you need to refund the remuneration which you receive from the company and second you need to pay for the damages to the creditors to the shareholders to the regulatory authorities and so 
right you need to pay the damages right so refund the remuneration and also pay for the damages right and also pay for the damages are you getting that everyone over here when auditor of the company has not complied with and then for say civil liability the entire firm will be liable criminal liability for imprisonment only the concerned partner or partners will be liable right the concerned partner or partners will be liable are you getting this one over here section 147 which is regarding the punishment for the non-compliance okay right tell me the applicability of section 132 Yes, what is the applicability of section 132? What is 132? You will say, ma'am, basic fundamental question we should know first. NFRA, right? the National Financial Reporting Authority. Um, which companies and auditors of which companies come under the lens of the NFRA? NFRA is watching you. Which companies NFRA watches? Whenever list of applicability is prepared. First one to March and go and sit in the list is who? Ah, very good. Listed company. They are the number unka aata hai. Listed company. Then apart from listed company, unlisted public company. They are second in the line. Unlisted public company having paid up share capital of more than or equal to 500 crore or having the turnover of more than or equal to 1000 crore or having the borrowing debenture deposits of more than or equal to 500 crore or having it or it is the insurance company, banking company or the electricity supply companies or any company where reference is made to the NFRA by the central government it is in public interest that you look into these entities you look into these entities right and then apart from that subsidiary or associate of any body corporate which is a subsidiary or associate of a to d above right, which contributes more than 20 percent of the consolidated income or the consolidated network right more than 20 percent of the consolidated income or the consolidated network Right. So, these are the companies which come under the purview, the lens of the NAFRA. And then what does it say over there? What are the functions of the NAFRA? What are the functions of the NFRA? To make recommendations to the CG regarding the issue of the auditing accounting standards and so. Right. Then after that, to monitor and enforce compliance with the auditing standards and the accounting standards. And then to improve, suggest measures for improvement of the standards. Right. To suggest measures for the improvement. Okay, right. So that is NFRA, the National Financial Reporting Authority, right? Certainly a very trending area for questions in your exams right now. Okay, right. Tell me what are the considerations for an auditor while doing the audit in an automated environment at each phase of the audit cycle? considerations for the auditor while doing audit in an automated environment at each phase of the audit cycle three times or four times question asked in your exams consideration of automated environment at each phase Pehle to mujhe phases batao. you'll say ma'am why you are asking us then whom do i ask to if i don't ask you then whom should i ask to i'll ask you only only you nobody else Nobody else listening to me. Only one person who is seeing me on the screen right now. My question is for you. You'll say, ma'am, we are feeling nervous. I'm very good, now. Then you'll study properly. Hmm. Relax. Tell me. I know you know it. Yes. Okay, your question kya tha? consideration of automated environment are systematically book mess up the county to what about I am a book me dick it was a bit that I am with me to put I will be a child of the puja to get me battery light like a year bulb bulb outdated LED LCD whatever you know how much of that is being activated is what we need to check now and as a testing can I test your luggage is consideration of automate why are you not giving answer today students re baba give no answer oh, nice all these names later on i should get a mail from you that ma'am i got an exemption in audit ma'am i got an all india rank ma'am i've become a chartered accountant and all you know i have just all this list of names over here i should get a list of mails from all of you i know done okay bolo heading heading to teach se bata do yaar
for the three hours when you are writing the audit paper, I will light a diya in front of God and sit in front of God that God, please be with all my students. Please, they are very sweet. They are very innocent. Okay. <laughs> I really like what can I do for you that time you know so near and dear to me all my students okay right hmm consideration of laga laga nahi laga you're ready for it. you say ma'am abhi aadat ho gayi foundation inter final ke do paper ho gaye abhi aur do to don't ask ma'am like we are so used to it I like to see the smile on your face. I'm good to see that. Okay. Consideration of automated environment at each phase of the audit cycle. What is the first phase? Risk assessment. Risk assessment. You identify the accounts and the disclosures. Then you check the quantitative and qualitative considerations. Then you check what is the likely sources of the misstatements. Right. Consider the risk arising from the use of the system. So that is risk assessment. Then what you do? Understand and evaluate. Right. So now you perform the system walkthrough, right? And of the end to end processes, right? Then you also prepare the risk and control matrices. Right. Then you understand the direct entity level controls and the indirect entity level controls. You check the IT general controls and the application control. Right. So understand and evaluate. Then you test for the operating effectiveness. So test for operating effectiveness, you check check for the Right. You do the control testing. So for doing the control testing, you obtain the data. For obtaining the data, one what you do? Right. You extract the data, then you check the completeness and accuracy of the data. And then you perform the testing of the data. And then finally you come to the reporting. Right. Finally you come to the reporting. Right. So if any deficiency is identified, one you report it to the when you identify a deficiency, then you check whether it's a significant deficiency. Then you check whether it's a material weakness. Right, then you communicate it to TCWG and you also communicate it to the shareholders. And now, Heda Ji to abhi Jai Mata Di bol rahe hai. And now, achche marks chahiye mujhe. Okay, right. That's my demand. That's my requirement. That's my wish. That's my blessing. Okay, anyways. And that's regarding the consideration of automated environment at each phase of the audit cycle. Are you understanding that? Did you know this? It's not that you don't know it. Itna mar mar ke padhe ho, sab pata hai tumhe. You know everything, but only the file opening has to happen correctly. Are you getting that, everyone? Consideration of automated environment at each phase of the audit cycle. Okay, right. Where in an audit can you make use of data analytics? Where in an audit can you make use of the data analytics? Hmm, data analytics. Yes, you can use it for the risk assessment, fraud risk assessment, Preliminary analysis, non-standard journal entry analysis, control testing and for the evaluation of the deficiency. This is where in an audit you can make use of the computers. That is you can make use of the data analytics. Right? The process, the process, what is data analytics? The process of generating the meaningful information from raw system data using processes, tools and techniques is referred to as the data analytics. Right? The process of generating the meaningful information from raw system data. And how do you uh, get the meaningful information? You apply processes, tools and techniques. Right? For that, you apply the processes, tools and techniques. Okay. Right. Tell me, what are the current period consolidation adjustments? Yes. Fata fat. Quickly, tell me, what are the Current period consolidation adjustments. Current period which arise on each occasion when consolidation is being done. Okay. Hmm. Yes. Intra group. Profit, intra group interest, intra group indebtedness. Then impairment losses on goodwill arising on consolidation. Okay. Harmonization of accounting policies. Different year ending dates. Right. Different year ending dates. Okay. Then changes in equity attributable to the NCI, that is the non controlling interest. Then conversion of foreign components, foreign gap into the local gap. Even that could come under the current period consolidation adjustments. Okay. Right. Calculation of minority that comes in the, permanent hota hai na? 
one is what the determination of goodwill or capital reserve arising on consolidation and second one is the equity attributable to the ncr non controlling interest okay elimination of intra group transaction subsequent events yes deferred tax adjustment right so these are the current period consolidation adjustments what are these these are the current period consolidation adjustments okay tell me as an auditor how do i evaluate the work of the expert evaluation of experts work i am doing the audit and now in my audit i come to know ke one actually uncle is there that uncle has done that actuarial valuation ka work and now i have to use the work of that uncle so now kaise how do i use the work of the actuary evaluation of the experts work so first you need to look into the first you need to look into the yes the competence the capability and the objectivity of the expert the competence the capability and the objectivity of the auditor's expert then we also have the sources to obtain information regarding the competence capability and objectivity of the expert like you can get the information with discussion with that expert discussion with others who are familiar with the work of that expert any previous experience with the work performed by that expert then published books or papers by that expert or knowledge of that expert's qualification members of relevant professional bodies license to practice or the firm's quality control policies and procedures and then after you evaluate the expert now you evaluate the work done by the expert how do you evaluate the work done by the expert findings and conclusions are they consistent with the other audit evidence then the relevance and reasonableness of the assumptions and methods which have been used by the expert and last one the relevance accuracy and completeness of the source data being used by the expert the relevance accuracy and completeness of the source data being used by the expert okay right then after that now give me an answer okay as an auditor how do you determine that a particular matter is a key audit matter determining key audit matters as an auditor how do you determine ke boss ye key audit matter how do you determine that it's a key audit matter yes how do you determine that a particular matter is a key audit matter if it's a matter of the higher assessed rmm or the significant risk right sr significant risk or where significant auditor judgment has been involved including evaluation of the management judgment so significant auditor judgment or a significant event or transaction that took place during the period a significant event or transaction that took place during the period determining the key audit matters right determining the key audit matters okay let us quickly discuss how will my audit report look like in case of a qualified opinion are you all with me let us all have a look at how does the format of the audit report look like in case of a qualified opinion right so what will be the title of my report independent auditors report to the members of abc company limited report on the audit of the stand alone financial statements and then after that what we will have over there qualified opinion what will be the heading of the paragraph now opinion paragraph qualified opinion in the qualified opinion what we will write down we have audited the accompanying financial statements of abc company limited which comprise the balance sheet statement of profit and loss cash flow statement right so for the year ended 31st march 2025 and the summary of significant accounting policies and other explanatory information itna exam mein drafting ka question aata hai aur bachche nahi likhte acche answer unko lagta hai mere ko qualified adverse disclaimer aata hai mujhe bahut aata hai are tumhe bahut aata hai aisa nahi hai ki nahi aata hai but yeah drafting bhi aana chahiye You should know. You तीन चार क्वेश्चन देख लेना ड्राफ्टिंग के 
Okay, qualified. We have audited the accompanying financial statements of tata 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 except for the effect of the matters described in the except for the effect of the matters described in the basis for qualified opinion paragraph the financial statements give the information required by the act and also give a true and fair view right give the information required by the act and also give a true and fair view then after qualified opinion what is going to be the next paragraph over there the basis for qualified opinion paragraph Paragraph. basis for qualified opinion paragraph now basis for qualified opinion paragraph what is the first thing you will write in this paragraph what is the first thing which you will write down in this paragraph right what is the matter which you will write down yes the matter which gave rise to the modification what happened why are you giving a qualified opinion the matter which gave rise to the qualification right the matter which gave rise to the modification the qualification right then after that what you write down we have conducted our audit in accordance with the standards on auditing specified under section 143 10 of the companies act 2013 then the reference to that section of the audit report where the responsibilities of the auditor have been given so here you don't write down the responsibilities you make a reference to that section of the audit report where the responsibilities of the auditor have been given then you say that we have complied with the ethical requirements including the independence that we are independent of the entity as per the code of ethics Right, so ethical requirements including the independence. And last one, we, we believe, what auditor says, we believe, what we believe that the audit evidence we have obtained, that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our qualified opinion. We believe that the audit evidence we have obtained is sufficient and appropriate to provide a basis for our qualified opinion. So, title, address the opinion, this, the qualified opinion, basis for qualified opinion, right? Then after that, going concern, if there is any material uncertainty related to going concern, you may mention about that. Key audit matter will always come. Whenever you issue qualified or adverse opinion, there will always be a key audit matter in your report. Because for the fact that you are issuing qualified or adverse, that itself is a key audit matter. There might be other key audit matters or there might not be other key audit matter and whenever you issue disclaimer of opinion there can never be a key audit matter paragraph in your report whenever you issue disclaimer of opinion there can never be a key audit matter paragraph in your report but whenever you issue qualified or adverse there is always going to be a key audit matter paragraph in your report okay so key audit matter then management's responsibility Management's responsibility, preparation of financial statements, internal control, accounting policies, accounting records, accounting standards, going concern, it, all that is the responsibility of the management. Then we say auditor's responsibility. What is auditor's responsibility? To obtain the reasonable assurance that financial statements are free from material misstatement, whether due to fraud or error. Right? Reasonable assurance. Right, then reasonable assurance is a high level of assurance but is not a guarantee that a misstatement which exists will always be detected by the auditor. Right, so no guarantee for fraud error detection. Right, so auditor's responsibility. After auditor's responsibility, you have the other reporting responsibilities. Section 143, subsection 3, duty as to reporting, the additional points of reporting over there. Right, and then after that you have the signature with membership number, firm registration number and the unique document identification number. Then you have the place of signature and the date. Right, so signature, place and the date. What are these? These are the elements of the audit report in case of a qualified opinion. Right, these are the elements of the audit report in case of the 
qualified opinion are you understanding that right title addressy qualified basis for qualified and qualified what you write down we have audited and except for the effect of the matters the financial statements give a true and fair view then basis for qualified opinion the matter which gave rise to the modification then key audit matter management's responsibility auditor's responsibility other reporting responsibilities and then you have the signature place and the date right the signature place and the date okay right so now if we proceed further and if you have to tell me the clause 18 of the caro what is clause 18 yes what is clause 18 of caro yes mehak your name has come after some time good to see it yes clause 18 Oh, every clause starts with a, oh, no? It is regarding the clause 18 of para 3 of Caro 2020. Yes, super. Clause 18 is regarding the resignation of the auditors. Where the auditors of the, whether there has been any resignation of the auditors during the year, whether the coming auditor whether the statutory auditor have they considered the issues objections and concerns raised by the outgoing auditors right whether the incoming auditors have they considered the issues objections and concerns which have been raised by the outgoing auditor so one this is clause 18 right then you also have the clause 8 of part 1 of the first schedule clause 8 of part 1 of the first schedule what is clause 8 of part 1 of the first schedule noc so this is noc this is ioc this is 8 this is 18 very good not bad means okay right so anyways noc what does it say accepts as per clause 8 and now exam may like this you'll write as per clause 8 8 number 8 of part 1 roman 1 of first schedule to the chartered accountants act 1949 a chartered accountant in practice is deemed to be guilty of professional misconduct if he, what did he do? Accepts appointment as an auditor previously held by another chartered accountant without first communicating with him in writing. Right? So, incoming auditor, if you fail to communicate with the outgoing auditor, you will be guilty of professional misconduct under 811. Right, so that is NOC and this is clause 18 which is regarding the right the, the IOC, the issues, objections and concerns. And then you also have the section 140 subsection 2 which is regarding the resignation of the company auditor. What does it say? In case if the auditor of the company resigns, then within 30 days from the date of the resignation, the auditor needs to file the form ADT three with the company and the ROC and if it's a government company then also file it with the C and AG the Comptroller and Auditor General of India and what if the auditor does not file this form three uh, form ADT3 with the company and ROC then it says the auditor will be liable for a fine which shall not be less than 50,000 or the remuneration of the auditor whichever is less and 500 rupees for each continuing day of default subject to a maximum of 2 lakh rupees and is subject to a maximum of 2 lakh rupees right so one we discuss noc then we discuss clause 18 of the caro and then the removal or the resignation of the company auditor right we discuss regarding the resignation of the company auditor right so if the auditor of the company resigns within 30 days right from the date of resignation the auditor has to file the form adt3 with company and roc and in case of a government company also with the c and ag right also with the C and A G. Okay. What is clause 2B of CAR? What is clause 2B of CARO 2020? I hope I don't need to write that, but I'll write it. Of CARO 2020. Yes, clause 2B. Whether clause 2A is inventory and 2B is working capital whether the company has been sanctioned working capital limit 
in excess of 5 crore on the basis of security of the current assets from the bank's financial institutions. Then what does it say? Whether the quarterly returns and statements which have been filed with the bank financial state institutions, whether the quarterly returns and statements, are they in agreement with the books of account? Are they in agreement with the books of account? Right? So, whether the company has been sanctioned at any point of time during the year, working capital limit in excess of 5 crore on the basis of security of the current assets from banks, financial institutions, then whether the quarterly returns and statements which have been submitted by the company to the bank, financial institution, auditor, you have to report whether they are in agreement with the books of account. Right, whether they are in agreement with the books of account. Okay, right. Tell me clause 16 of Caro. And recently they asked, I expect them to ask it again. And surprisingly, they asked regarding poor investment company and all. Okay, right. What is clause 16 of Caro? It is regarding the array. I say, don't wait in between. Keep on giving the answers. Others give, don't give, don't worry about them. They will get their marks, you will get your marks. You understand? No. You have to distribute your own sweets on the day of result. Then somebody else can buy your success, your sweets. Is it right? Hmm? Yes. What is clause 16? The registration with the RBI and the NBFCs. What does it say? Whether the company is required to be registered. Kya must there? Whether the company is required to be registered under Section 45IA of the RBI Act, then whether the registration has been obtained. When is the company required to be registered? At least 50% of the gross income should be income from financial assets and at least 50% of the total asset should be the financial asset. And then it says minimum net on funds of the 2 crore then it is required to be registered. You need to check for the PBA, Principal Business Activity, 50-50 test. You know, the Principal Business Activity. So, whether the company has conducted any non-banking, uh, sorry, whether the company is required to be registered under Section 45 IA of the RBI Act, right? whether the registration has been obtained, then whether the company has conducted any non-banking financial or any housing finance activity without holding a certificate of registration. So, whether they have conducted any non-banking financial or any housing finance activity without obtaining a certificate of the registration. Then, when the company is a CIC, whether it continues to fulfill the criteria of being a CIC and where it is an exempted or an unregistered CIC, where it is an exempted or an unregistered CIC, whether it continues to fulfill such criteria. So, if you are a registered CIC, whether you fulfill the criteria of being a registered CIC. If you are an exempted unregistered CIC, whether you continue to fulfill the criteria of being an unregistered or an exempted CIC. What is the CIC? Core investment company where more than 90% of your investment is in the group. Out of that, at least 60% is in the equity. You do not do any trading other than through the block sale. Right? You do not do any trading in the securities of those companies except for the block sale and you do not do any other financial activity. So, no sale other than the block sale and no other act financial activity other than dealing with the investments in the group companies. Okay, right. So that's a core investment company. And then core investment company does it have access to public funds or does not have access to public fund. And if there are a number of CICs which are part of the group, then indicate the total number of CICs which are part of the group. So if there are a number of CICs, indicate the total number of CICs which are part of the group, right? So that is clause 16, which is regarding the registration with the RBI, right? What is clause 8 of CARO? Clause 8 of Para 3 of Caro 2020. Whether, yes, whether transactions which are, transactions which are not recorded in the books of account have not been recorded in the books of account have now been surrendered or disclosed as income during the 
tax assessments under the income tax law then what does it say whether the previously unrecorded income whether the previously unrecorded income whether now it has been properly recorded in the books of account whether the previously unrecorded income whether now it has been properly recorded in the books of account are you understanding that clause 8 transactions not recorded in the books have now been surrendered or disclosed as during the tax assessments under the income tax law whether the previously unrecorded income whether now it has been properly recorded in the books of account right so this will come in your books of account as a prior period item right so tax evasion done in earlier years and now it has been surrendered during the tax assessments so it says the previously unrecorded income whether it has now been properly recorded in the books of account right whether it has been properly recorded in the books of account are you getting this one everyone okay and one last one where the opening ceremony is awaited no question asked so far clause 19 which is regarding the material uncertainty regarding the ability to meet the liabilities Right, material uncertainties. Right, so you need to do a one-year liquidity check that the one next one year whether the company will be solvent. How you can check one next one year solvency? It says on the basis of the financial ratios, on the basis of the aging and the expected date of realization of financial assets and the payment of financial liabilities. Right, then the auditor's knowledge of the board of directors, the other information accompanying the financial statements and the management plans. Whether the auditor is of the opinion that as on the date of the audit report, no material uncertainty exists, that the company is capable of meeting its liabilities as and when they fall due within a period of one year from the balance sheet date. Right, so say if the year end is 31st March 2025, then what is one year from the balance sheet date? 1st April 2025 to 31st March 2026, which you more popularly know it as the foreseeable future. So whatever liabilities will come on the company in the next one year, as and when they fall due, like they'll have to repay the bank loan, they'll have to pay the statutory dues, they'll have to pay salary, then they'll have to make the payment to creditor. So whatever liabilities they fall due, whether the company will is capable of meeting its liabilities. And as on the date of the audit report, as and when they fall due within a period of one year from the balance sheet date. Right, within a period of one year from the balance sheet date right so that is material uncertainty regarding the ability to meet the liabilities okay right tell me what is clause 6 of part 1 of the first schedule and tell me what is clause 6 of part 1 of the second schedule clause 6 of part 1 of the first schedule and clause 6 of part 1 of the second schedule is ethics oh. Clause 8, yeah, in SA 250, it's a non-compliance with law regulation. You've not complied with the provisions of income tax law. Okay. Right. So, Clause 6, so our most favorite one in ethics. As per Clause 6 of Part 1 of the first schedule to the Chartered Accountants Act 1949, a Chartered Accountant in Practice, as I likhna exam mein, a Chartered Accountant in Practice is deemed to be guilty of professional misconduct if he, what did he do? advertises there we go advertises it comes under clause 7 you know if he solicits right because i read advertise even i said advertise right if he solicits client or professional work you know client or professional work directly or indirectly you know kuch logo ki style hoti hai directly nahi indirectly and directly or indirectly through circular, advertisement, personal communication, interview or by any other means. Provided that, you know, exceptions to 611, provided that nothing contained herein shall be construed as preventing or prohibiting a member from applying, requesting, inviting, securing professional work from another CA in practice or responding to tenders or inquiries issued by various users of professional services from time to time and getting the professional work as a consequence right so solicit client or professional work right so then guilty of professional misconduct under 611 and what is 612 clause 6 part 1 of the second schedule fails to report a material
material misstatement known to him right which is not disclosed in the financial statements with which he is concerned in a professional capacity right so fails to report a material misstatement right so fails to report a material misstatement right so how do you report a material misstatement by issuing a qualified or a adverse opinion but instead of issuing qualified or adverse you give a unmodified opinion then guilty of professional misconduct under clause 6 part 1 of the second schedule okay right say a chartered accountant is having one office in mumbai and one office he is having in the suburbs of mumbai which are right which are yes 70 kilometers or yes say let me put anything 70 kilometers away from the main office and there is an uncle retired income tax commissioner who is responsible for this particular office in the suburbs of mumbai is the chartered accountant guilty has he complied with the provisions of the chartered accountants act he has one office in mumbai one in the suburbs of mumbai which is 70 kilometers away from the main office Right, and there is an uncle over there. Who's what? Who is this uncle? Retired income tax commissioner. Right. So what do we say? Section twenty-seven. Areva, very good. What does it say? Section twenty-seven. Each branch of a CA should be under the separate charge of a member of the institute. However, no separate charge is required if the second office is located in the same city, or if it is located in the same accommodation, or if it is located within fifty kilometers from the principal limits of the city in which the first office is located. Here is it within fifty kilometers from the principal limits of the city no it is 70 kilometers suburbs it's not within 50 kilometers had it been 30 kilometers then okay right so is this uncle okay no this uncle not okay you have need to have a chartered accountant in charge of that particular office right so what does it say section 27 each office of a ca should be under a separate charge of a member of the institute however no separate charge is required if the second office is located in the same city or it is in the same accommodation or premises or it is within 50 kilometers from the municipal limits of the city in which the first office is located right in which the first office is located okay right chartered accountant you know became a chartered accountant yesterday yesterday became ca yesterday institute result came and became chartered accountant and today he printed a visiting card and on the visiting card he is saying i am f c a भगवान ये कैसे ना क्लास नहीं करते ऑडिट का फिर ऐसा करते यस <laughs> यस uh, yes. yes, कल का आया हुआ बच्चा आज बोल रहा है मैं एफ सी ए हूं वॉट टू डू वॉट टू डू गिल्टी वेरी गुड उर्वी गिल्टी मैम इसको तो गिल्टी कर दो ओके ये वन टू वन कहा से लाया है कुछ भी नहीं लेके आने का वन टू वन स्पेस और अलाउस इमोल्यूमेंट ना यस क्लॉज वन ऑफ पार्ट थ्री ऑफ द फर्स्ट शेड्यूल नॉट बीइंग अ फेलो acts as a fellow member of the institute do you know that not being a fellow acts as a fellow member of the institute guilty of professional misconduct under clause 1 part 3 of the first schedule and not being a fellow acts as a fellow member of the institute are you getting that okay practicing ca how many tax audits is allowed to accept 60 and this ca he accepted 70 tax audits Practicing CA, how many tax audit accept kar sakta hai? One chartered accountant, tell me, 60. This CA, he said, no, I will throw to 70 tax audit. Out? Out where? Guilty where? Guilty under? Has the font you use in CA final book changed? This is the font. So, maybe there might be some iterations which come. Yeah, but I'll tell you. Clause. Vishak 132 kya hai? Imprisonment for more than 6 months hai na? Wo kyun laya yaan pe? I generally don't like to call out names but no problem. I can. 
CD with this stupid language. Hmm, yes. What is this? 60 tax audits allowed to be accepted. He accepted 70. So he's not complied with the general guidelines of the council. And if you don't comply with the guidelines of the council, then you're guilty of professional misconduct under clause 1 of part 2 of the second schedule. What does it say? Contravenes any of the provisions of this act. Contravenes does not comply. Contravenes any of the provisions of this act or the regulations made there under or the guidelines issued by the council. Right? Any of the provisions of this act, regulations made there under or the guidelines issued by the council. Is it clear to all of you? Turbans with the voice also. Okay. Right. So clause one, part two of the second schedule, which is regarding the contravenes. Okay. Tell me the mandatory areas of review by the audit committee. Ye to kitne baar? Five to six times this question is coming the exam. Then you tell me that you don't know these points. <clears throat> I don't know why the voice should echo, but maybe. Inherent limitations. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> yes, mandatory areas of review by the audit committee. Mandatory areas of review. Okay, audit committee. You have to mandatory review these areas. Yes. What mandatory areas of review are there? First point, so ek to they are saying it. Yes, contents of the MDNA, the management discussion and analysis. Okay. Then the yes, the internal auditors report, right? The internal auditors report. Then the letter of weakness, which is issued by the statutory auditor, then the appointment removal and the terms of remuneration of the chief internal auditor, the appointment removal and the terms of remuneration of the chief internal auditor and then after that also what does it say? Right? The statement of the deviations, the utilization of the issue proceeds, right? the statement of the deviations of the issue proceeds. Okay. Right, do multiple offices situated in the same city separate charges required? Yeah, because the exception is only for the second office. So if you have a third office, fourth office, for that you require a separate charge. Okay. Right. A related party is deleted. That is what I wanted to check. Are Baba, that is a change now. Okay, the second point tha, mandatory areas of review of audit committee may mandate or no statement of significant related party transaction. That point has been deleted. And uh, that point is not there. Okay, so contents of MDNA, internal auditor's report, letter of weakness issued by the statutory auditor, appointment removal in terms of remuneration of the chief internal auditor and also the statement of deviation. So what are these? These are the mandatory areas of review by the audit committee. What is the role of the risk management committee? What is the role of the risk management committee? Yes, what is the role of the risk management committee? One, to design a risk management policy. Now, in order to decide a risk management policy, they need to first identify the risk framework. And accordingly, then what you say, risk, respond to mitigate the risk and so. Then after that, this risk management policy, accordingly, they need to formulate the methodologies and the systems. Then what do they need to do? This risk management policy is required to be implemented. Then you need to review this risk management policy at least once in every two years. Then whatever are the actions which are being taken by the risk management committee, they need to keep the board of directors informed regarding the same. Then if the company has a chief risk officer, then the appointment, removal and terms of remuneration of him will be subject to review by the risk management committee. And this committee will coordinate its functions with the other committees. Right? This committee will coordinate its functions with the other committees. Right? So that's the role of the risk management committee. Right? The role of the risk management committee. Which companies are required to constitute risk management committee? Top 1000 listed entities. How many times meetings of the risk management committee? At least twice in a year. At least two times in a year. Right? They need to meet right? the uh, risk management committee. Audit committee four times in a year. Right? But this has to be the role is two times in a year. The risk management committee. Okay. Right. So, how to retain ethics clause number, right? So, you can uh, just look into it and uh, parts and schedules and accordingly decide. Okay, I think I've missed out how to retain ethics clause number. So, what you can... Um, 
Okay. Right. So, anyway, that's what we have discussed. Let's just have a quick look at uh, the content of the book over here. Right. So, one today we started with by looking at the NFRA orders and all of those. Right. And then after that, um, yes, uh, whichever book you have or if you have the institute study material with you also, that would be great. Right. So, this is one Audit Express, the edition 3, which I am having over here. Right. So, there are all the questions which have been put in a annual report format, easy format to read. Even if you see school textbook, they are there in this tabular format. Okay. So, if you see the contents, right, so review is an important question over there regarding what is the engagement partner review. So, in the review, what they are going to check whether work has been done as per the PSLR. What is PSLR? Professional standards and legal regulatory requirement. Then significant matters have been raised for further consideration. Consultations have been taken. Whether there is a need to revise the audit procedures work performed. The work performed supports the conclusions reached. Sufficient appropriate evidence has been obtained. And also whether the objective of the engagement have been achieved. Right? This is what will be covered in the review. And then you also have the EQCR review. Okay, What will be covered in the engagement quality control review. Right, So what will be covered in the EQCR review? The independence evaluation, risk identified and the responses. Then the judgments made particularly with relation to materiality. Then the consultation taken. Then the corrected and uncorrected misstatements. Matters communicated to TCWG. Then documentation supports the conclusion reach and the appropriateness of the report. So, what I want to tell you over here, there are two types of review. One is the senior review, the engagement partner review. And second one is the EQCR review, the engagement quality control review or review. And so, what are the points to be covered in this review? And then if there are any complaints, you know, article wants to file a complaint against the CA firm or, you know, the uh, article or the client wants to file a complaint against the chartered accountant or so. So, one, you can file a complaint with the disciplinary mechanism of the ICAR or second, there could be an internal mechanism process of the firm for resolving into complaints. Right? So, there should be policies and procedures that complaints and allegations that the firm has not complied with the PSLR, professional standards and legal regulatory requirement and also the firm system of the quality control. So now this complaint either it could originate from within the firm or it could come from outside the firm. Right? Then there should be clearly defined channels as to how you can raise your concern. Then once a concern is received, it needs to be investigated by a person other than the person who has been involved in that particular audit. If required, you can also take the help of the legal counsel. Then whatever are the results of the investigation, based on that, the appropriate action should be taken. Right? Based on that, the appropriate action should be taken. And then after that, you have a few extra, you know, additional questions over there. Right? Inherent limitations of an audit professional skepticism right so in case if you have a um, what do you say already finished and no need for you to study you can uh, be aware that there is such a book uh, is called as the audit express which is a 409 page book like if you look at the main book it is like 300 300 so around 600 pages but this is all compiled together coming to like what you say around 400 pages over there okay right then after that if we cover a few questions right so i've already discussed with you regarding the sqc tell me okay in the audit documentation is it possible for you to document that each and every auditing standard that you've complied with Okay, you know, I've complied with 300, I've complied with uh, 315, I've complied with 210, I've complied with 705. It says no, it is neither practicable nor necessary. Neither practicable nor necessary to document every single matter. What does it say? If you prepared an audit plan, that means that you would have followed the requirements of 300. If you issued an engagement letter, that means you would have followed the requirements of 210. If you have modified your opinion, that means you would have followed the requirements of SA705. Right? And there is no single way by which auditor's professional skepticism can be documented. You know, we say auditor, you should maintain alertness throughout the audit, maintain an attitude of professional skepticism. Now, how to document? So, it says there is no single way as to how to document the professional skepticism of the auditor, right? There is no single way. Okay, right? And then just towards the end, let me just discuss with you the going concern, right? As an auditor, what we need to do, going concern, very favorite question area for question in the exam. So, for going concern, we need to check for the appropriateness of the management's use of the going concern assumption in the preparation and presentation of financial statements and whether there is any material 
uncertainty regarding the entity's ability to continue as a going concern right whether there is any material uncertainty regarding the entity's ability to continue as a going concern so now say as an auditor i found out that going concern assumption is appropriate but there is a material uncertainty and adequate disclosures have been made in the financial statements then as an auditor what i need to do i need to issue an unmodified opinion clean report with a material uncertainty related to going concern fact right so going concern assumption is appropriate but there is a material uncertainty and management had made the adequate disclosures in the financial statements then auditor what you will do you will issue an unmodified opinion with a material uncertainty related to going concern para right then second one going concern assumption is appropriate right material uncertainty exists and adequate disclosures have not been made by the management in the financial statements management has not made the adequate disclosures in the financial statements then in that case auditor what you need to do either issue a qualified opinion or issue an adverse opinion okay true and fair except for or you say they are not a true and fair right adverse opinion right third situation management is unwilling to do the assessment of going concern and right? management unwilling to do assessment you are telling management management please check the going concern assumption of their entity and they say no we are unwilling to do the assessment so then what you do you consider the implications on the audit because it might lead to a limitation on scope you consider the implications on the audit and last situation you say that going concern assumption is inappropriate this entity is not a going concern they should not have prepared their accounts on the going concern basis so in that case auditor you will issue an adverse opinion that the financial statements of the company do not give a true and fair view right that the financial statements of the company do not give a true and fair view right so situation one going concern assumption appropriate but an uncertainty exists and disclosures are made so unmodified with material uncertainty related to going concern para situation 2 going concern assumption appropriate material uncertainty exists disclosures not made in financial statements qualified or adverse opinion third one management unwilling to do the assessment consider the implications for the audit and the last one going concern assumption is inappropriate in that case auditor you issue a adverse opinion right in that case auditor you need to issue an adverse opinion okay right when you go into the exam halls first what you need to do is solve the mcq students always have a dilemma whether i should do the mcq first or whether i should do the uh, theory part first so according to me my personal agenda or my suggestion would be that you do the mcq part first in 40 to 45 minutes you should be able to complete with all the mcq okay right then after the mcq you come to the question answers over there right so now the question number 1 is compulsory and there are three questions over there 5 5 and 4 marks or so right so you have the 14 marks over there right so now what you do this question number Number one, A, B, C. Hello, A, B, C. Then you have question number two, question number three, four, five, and six. And each of them is also having the five, five, four mark questions over there. And you need to solve any four out of the remaining five questions, right? You need to solve any four out of the remaining five questions, right? So one question number one, which is compulsory, if you are confident you know it's generally regarding the auditing standards and something regarding accounting standard schedule 3 over there you can start with those or if you see question number 5 all three concept questions over there is what you know about you can write that first so you should write your best answer first but that does not mean that you take more time for it now that you know it properly so you should be writing it quickly and finishing it so that those answers where you are not that good you can give more time over there you understand the point okay and what do you do no like you are writing question number 1a okay so question number 1a so it is regarding essay 265 or something then after that you write down the you know leaving a line in between you write down the sentences you underline the important words and say it gets over over here now don't next page it gets over now don't start 1b over there what you do 1b start on fresh page question number 1b 
started again you write so that later on if any thought comes to your mind or any other you know point you would remember of you can add it over there if you don't leave the space over there then there is no scope of adding a point over there later on right some questions don't change the sequence like can i write question number 5 first yes but can i write question number 5c first no some sequence you have to maintain a b c is the format in which you need to write you understand you have 180 minutes of the paper like 180 minutes 3 hours of the paper 20 minutes let me keep it as a buffer so effectively you have 160 minutes and now like the main tempo of the paper is in this 160 minutes and you have 100 marks of the paper to be written so that means you have 1.6 minute per mark you have 1.6 minute per mark right? so that logically says that 30 marks of the mcq is there so into 1.6 so that comes to 48 minutes so that's why i told you 40 to 45 minutes is what you need to use for the mcq okay don't read mcq too much in rush and students but because first time what thought comes to your mind that thought lingers in the mind you know it stays back in the mind so don't reach to a confusion or don't you know read it in a hey by manner don't read it too dramatically and too slowly also be an objective speed reader you know don't miss out any line read it and whatever you find like important you can just keep those key try to find out the connects over there right then in the options what you need to do you need to find out okay okay these are the incorrect options or which is the one correct option right and have some confidence you know because even though you don't know the answer even though if you are trying to take a risk because there is no negative marking be confident in taking the risk because what happens on that confidence it will be reflected in your other answers also your confidence other, oh i don't know but now i don't know so but let me take a or let me write b or no no, no be confident can change your life you know these three hours but only three hours you've been studying for 300 hours 400 hours or whatever number of hours but this three hours of the game change so be confident be like a warrior be like a soldier don't get suppressed don't have any demotivating thought I mean, just shrug them like you know if a fly comes i'm eating food or if i'm teaching over here and mosquito comes fly come do i have to come sit over here no problem bite everywhere or you know no what i do shh, shh, move so like that you know you have to be like so powerful mentally you have to be powerful when you're writing the exams you know that you will be writing the best answers your handwriting will be good your presentation will be good you will remember all the points and i am confident about this 100 percent i'm telling you now whatever is the remaining time what you need to do pick up one one topic take a chapter like it was a pure post-mortem analysis and a study it properly mind maps i have uploaded all the mind maps for the standards and auditing on the telegram channel you look at one mind map over there and you will revise the entire standard over there and you will be able to cover the entire standard ethics do the second schedule today tomorrow do the first schedule car do 10 clauses today to do 11 clauses you know in the later part of the day right then study for forensic audit today internal management operational audit today consolidated financial statement go through the amendments go through mtp rtp suggested of last three attempts at least put your heart and soul into the study let not let let there be no judgment about yourself you know i say you will pass the judgment you don't pass your judgment. You You just put in the hard work from your side. You know, you never realize till the day of result also you keep on thinking God knows what will happen. God. So anyways, you know, now God knows what will happen. So you just do your role. No, you just do your role. Okay, right. Confident, okay, compulsory right ABC part in the sequence. Yeah, one after the other. That's how it should be. Uh, we need to maintain yeah okay right so thank you sir. class 19 of caro is like relevant you may mention it over there along with going concern okay right so thank you so much for giving me your time right now which is oh my god more precious than diamond and uh, i hope i have done good justice to your time if anything went wrong from my side my apologies for the same and uh, yes i will put some questions on the telegram channel for mcq so you can also uh, 
is Sorosos. And uh, apart from that, you can also look into the mind maps over there for the standards on auditing. Bye-bye. Wish you all the very best. And my blessings and good wishes are always there with each one of you. Thank you so much.